Tell your story, build your brand. ArtMediaNorthwest.com. A R T M E D I A N W.com. Now, enjoy this conversation with Stuart. Stuart, thank you for being on the podcast and for taking the time. You're welcome. I'm honored. This is really flattering, and, and it's a lot of fun and you know, to connect with you again after all these years, you know, but also, yeah, I'm flattered. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, so how did your creative journey start? Well, um, looking back on it, I think I've always been creative. I didn't necessarily think of that. You know, I wrote my first song when I was like six years old. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. It was called Trash Can Willie. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, it was about five pages long. <laughs> That's a long it, song. It, it was like one of Dylan's epics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I performed it for my family. Me and my friend Paul wrote it. Anyhow, that was, that was my first real creative thing that I did. I think I was six. But I was inspired. I grew up in the '60s, you know. So the coolest thing in the world in the '60s was to be a musician. I uh, went to a Jimi Hendrix concert when I was uh, like 11, wow, or so, and uh, maybe 12. And I just that was it, you know. That's incredible. I, I wanted to be as cool as him, <laughs> right? You know, I, and um, so I stole my sister's guitar and locked myself in my bedroom, and. Uh, Became a musician. Nice. Yeah. I love that. Um, so you actually saw Hendrix. I did. Yeah. I did. And the only reason I got to go was because my best friend Gary's older brother, Ed, wanted to go. And his parents wouldn't let him go unless he took Gary. And Gary wouldn't go unless he took me. <laughs> and I didn't even know who the guy was. But right. uh, we uh, we went and my life was changed. My oh, dad yeah. asked me the next day. He said, so, uh, son, how did you like the show last night? You know, and I'm like, it was great, dad. I know what I want to be when I grow up. And he went, so what's that? And I said, a black rock star. <laughs> We had a hard time relating to each other after oh. that moment. My dad and I went downhill. Oh, that's too bad. I'm not sure if it was the black part or the rock star part, oh, but yeah. you know, either way, he couldn't couldn't relate. Well, Jimi Hendrix was brilliant, and I can understand why you'd want to be like that. Because, uh, man, what a talent! Yeah. So, what drew you to music uh, beyond that? Like you, you said. Uh, I think some of your family... Yeah, my, my grandma, I come from a musical family. Okay. Uh, my grandma, my grandmother um, was in, they had a family band. And my grandmother, you know, I'm an old guy, so my grandmother came over in a wagon. In a wagon. Really? Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. S- they settled in Montana. Wow. Um, and uh, they, they did that whole journey thing. Um, so, anyhow. My, my dad's mom. Anyhow, they had a, a family band. They had 13 people in the band. We had newspaper clippings that wow. uh, of, of them. They were kind of famous in their region. And uh, so, you know, mom and dad and cousins, and uh, she had eight brothers and sisters, and so they had a 13-piece band, an orchestra. That's amazing. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that was that, and so she always played, and she had perfect pitch. Everybody used to brag about how my grandmother had perfect pitch. She could hum a note, and Boeing played on She could tune a piano. Wow. And uh, my uncle played saxophone, was a band leader through college, and my dad played in the same band, upright bass, and uh, in swing bands. And so that's how they they put themselves through college, doing that. Oh, wow. It's a lot of talent in the family. And, and my dad, um, well, I don't know how good we were. My mom, my grandma had perfect pitch. But uh, Uncle Bob went on to have a creative life, not as a musician. But my dad, he loved music. And... So we, I listened to music. There was always music around the house. Yeah. You know? My dad was a 50s guy, martinis and Nat King Cole and Frank Sinatra, you know? Yeah. He made his own uh, stereos. Oh, wow. Because he couldn't get good stereos back in the day. They used to have these uh, kits that you could make with these tube amplifiers and stuff. I think they were called Heath Kit, maybe. Um, yeah, so my dad was a, a hobbyist and uh, just loved music. So yeah. he always had music around. So where did you grow up, and how did your journey to Oregon come about? That's a long story. It's a long story. That's we a long got one. we got time. Well, that's a long one. I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll try to cliff note it. Now, my dad was in the military, and we moved around a lot. The most interesting part about that for me was when I was nine, my dad took an assignment in Rome, Italy. And it was only supposed to be a couple of years, but that wasn't figuring the Italians. <laughs> I have heard this about the trains, too. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah. The thing about the Italian trains is, you know, nobody really gives a shit. <laughs> Because there's always a coffee shop or a wine bar close by, you know. It's one of the things I love about the Italian culture. And they're pretty relaxed about that. And so the assignment went on a little bit longer. And so my formative years were, in, were spent in Rome, Italy. Wow. And uh, it took me a long time to accept that. But it's more interesting to say I was, I'm from Rome than it was a military base. Right. But it feels more that way in my heart. Yeah. You know, well, cult- you speak Italian too, I right? do. Yeah. I do, yeah. Um, then we moved to America when I was uh, 15, and uh, or not quite 15. It's a little hazy in there. We moved to Sacramento. I also like to say that uh, I got to spend the summer 69 in San Francisco. Yeah. Because this girl, Jenny's boyfriend, Jenny was a cool girl, lived on her block, and her boyfriend had a GTO. His name was Jerry, and he was probably 18, 19 or something. He was the coolest guy in the world and the nicest guy because he used to let us all pile on the back of the the GTO, and he'd take us to Golden Gate Park like every Saturday and every Sunday for that entire summer. Awesome. And I saw all kinds of cool acts. You know, yeah. I saw Hendrix again, of course, and Janis Joplin. I mean, that was a really happening time. That had a big influence on me. The music was so good at that point in time. They were so free. Yeah. It was just nothing they couldn't do. Right. And everybody was just going, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Right? It was really, really an inspiring time. I'm not sure if it was all for the right reasons, but regardless, it was a really inspiring time. Yeah. And, uh, it had a big impact impact on me, uh, cultu- culturally, emotionally, and uh, and uh, creatively. So from Sacramento, we moved to Key West, Florida. Florida. Then I started getting in trouble. I actually got started getting in trouble in Sacramento, and which is why we moved to Key West. Ah. And I don't know if the summer of '69 had anything to do with it. I think it actually did, because I took to it like fish and water. I really did. And so I got involved in the drug culture at a really young age. Mm. And uh, and so my dad wanted to get the hell out of Sacramento because he was uh, very justifiably shocked and afraid by that. But we moved to Key West, Florida, which was worse. Wow. Okay. You know, in Sacramento, we were smoking pot, and Key West, we were shooting heroin, and so I left home really soon after that, and um, and uh, got caught up in a, in a pretty negative and dark side of my life. Yeah. And uh, got uh, caught up in the drug culture. So you're asking me how I ended up from there to here? Yeah. I mean, that's a that's a lot of years in there, and uh, so I. I was, I escaped Miami or South. I moved from Key West to Miami and from South. I escaped South Florida trying to escape drugs. Okay. Uh, and um, I was smart enough to, even a, as a teenager, to, to go. To realize. Yeah, this is not my path. Right. Uh, you know, I've, I've experienced this enough and this isn't my path. And so I moved to Colorado by accident. I spent a few years there. So musically, how what I was doing all this time is I was still playing. You know, I yeah. was I was playing. I was always playing. So there was a kid in the next door. He had a guitar. We played. You know, and then uh, you know I was always playing. Um, not anything professionally until I got to Colorado. When I got to Colorado, I was um, eight, 19 years old, eighteen, nineteen, and I started playing in taverns for tips. Okay. You know, and I hitchhiked across the country doing that. And and then uh, you know got into what I like to call the um, the Americana country uh, thing you know like the Eagles that that sort yeah. of that sort of vein I really enjoyed doing that I got a Martin guitar and um, and so that was my musical journey up to that point then I moved to Los Angeles and started getting into I've always played the blues the blues was always my my foundation okay um, and and and. Americana folk kind of stuff. I like that, you know, not, uh, what was it? How can I describe it? Because I don't want to put anything down because I like all genres. Yeah. But the, just the really rawness of that, you know, just really excites me. Still. Yeah. Still. You still have the same Martin guitar, don't you? I do. Yeah. I have the same Martin guitar that I bought when I was 18 years old when I first moved to Colorado. That's awesome. Yeah. It sounds good. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody says that. I, yeah. I got lucky. I, I played guitars in that music store for like five hours and just kept turning around. And the guy said, you found one yet? And I go, yeah, I think so. One of these five. <laughs> and I picked that one. Not that I really had a great year. It was probably just totally luck. 
but yeah. I lucked out and got a real sweet guitar, an exceptional one, and I still have it. And then I moved to Los Angeles, and then I got caught up in the same thing again, you know? Was, mm-hmm. I'm just like a fly to a moth to a light when it comes to those things. But in those years, I was playing in bands more popular. I did some jazz, played with some jazz cats for a while, and did some rock and roll. I wasn't... Uh, really into a lot of the rock and roll at the time but i uh i did different things you yeah. know and um so that was that and uh so i spent a good part of my 20s in in los angeles okay and uh same thing i got into a lot of got into some trouble and uh not with the law but troubles with myself you know and i was just going deeper and deeper I got married to a wonderful woman, and I knew that I didn't want that life for us. And so I escaped L.A. and and, uh, came to Portland to start a a life, you Mm -hmm. know, and get clean again. And that's how I ended up. That was in 1980. Okay. And then she and I started a family. And, yeah, so that's the journey. All right. That's part of it. Got to Oregon. And then, uh, so when I met you, you were at, we were both at Portland State, PSU. Mm Mm-hmm. And you were kind of starting a new chapter in your life at that time. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so the wonderful woman I was telling you about, she and I were going through a divorce. Okay. That was, you know, that's not an easy time for anybody. But I didn't go to high school because I quit school to be a punk and, you know, got caught up in the drug culture, as I already described. And so I had no education. And although I really loved what I was doing, I really enjoyed being a carpenter. I was good at it. I was creative. Yeah. I just knew that it wasn't for me at, at long term. There was something something missing. I was really longing. And I don't know, maybe it was music. Maybe it was creativity. Maybe it was something completely different. But th- th- there's a lot of successful businessmen in my family. I have some uh, some instincts in that regard. Yeah. Um, and that was probably one of the reasons that I kept being pulled back into the drug culture because I was kind of good at it. And so I always felt like there was other opportunities for me. So since I wasn't living with my family, I had to start all over again. I went, okay, so I'm going to start all over again. So I started a rock band and went to college. There you go. And so that's where we met. Yeah. I was at Portland State, and I had my rock band, and I was pursuing anything. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I wanted to get an education. I was thinking that I wanted to get a business degree, Yeah. but I was just following the path of most interest for me at that time. And so I, uh, yeah, so that's what I was doing. I, you know, went to college late. I think I started college at 38 and okay. uh, went for four years. Yeah. I've got no degree, 180 <laughs> credits, and I don't even have a degree in sight. But uh, I, I learned a lot, and uh, I ended up getting a job out of it, and uh, which I've been doing for 20-plus years. Well, I do think that uh, people should go to school to learn, not for their grades or their degree. No, I can't say that. You can't uh, say that. No, I can't say that. Okay. I, th- I think it's I think it's important that both tracks are well respected. Yeah. Really, I, I tell young people that are going to college, you know, in the family, you know, when you sure. meet and stuff, and they, I say, look, just for your first two years, go ahead and pick something, but don't worry about it because you can change it. You know, it, you don't really have to start getting serious about picking something until after a couple of years. Yeah. So just go take a whole lot of different variety and, and see what inspires you. Because you may go in thinking you want to be a geologist and walk out being an IT guy because you were inspired by a teacher. So don't limit yourself. You yeah. Know? Be free. That's good. You know, be free. And and my daughter graduated with a degree thinking that she was going to be um, a Greenpeace person and change the world. And, and she ended up working on Wall Street. And she, she's so inspired by her life now. So I think it's good for people to, to learn. I told my kids when they were young, I said, look, go to college. Because when you get out of high school, you're 18 years old, 17, 18 years old, right? And what are you going to do? Right. You go to work at McDonald's <laughs> or go to college, you know? So, you know. Just learn and, 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 and fill yourself up. If you don't have an idea what you want to do, don't be intimidated by that. Just go and learn. Filling the well is good. Yeah. Filling the well is really, really yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. And if you have a vision, that's great too. I, I think so. But don't lock and load it. <laughs> yeah, I have seen a lot of people change their path along the way. So what are some challenges you faced as an artist and as a business owner and leader 
me. I'm my biggest challenge. I get in my way. My self-doubt, self-questioning, my schizophrenic personality. Um, uh, um, you know, part of me is 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 really uh, impulsive and creative. And another part of me is really conservative. And so I'm constantly, you know, walking out the door and going, yeah, we're going to go. And we're going to. And then the other part of me is going, dude, relax. It's just <laughs> hell. You know, just chill out. And you can't do that. You don't have the money. You don't know anybody. You're not smart enough. You're not good looking enough. You just, you know, just relax, you know, settle. And I have this thing and it really kind of gets dichotomy in dichotomy of the yeah, two. And it yeah. really gets in my way. Yeah. I think everybody suffers from uh, from self doubt, yeah. um, and some people more than others. I don't think Bill Gates suffered from a lot of self doubt, um, but uh, or Bowie, but right. uh, <laughs> uh, I did, and I still do, even in business, even as a manager and as a creative. And I've been reasonably successful in business, and almost every situation that I can look back on where I did not. Um, reach the highest potential of the dynamic, it was because I was holding myself back in some way. So that's the advice that I try to give to the world is just get the hell out of your way. Trust yourself and just know that nobody cares. Nobody's listening. Nobody's paying attention. It's just you. It's up to you it's, to get up every morning and do something for 16 hours and make it count. Can you tell us about Nia and your work with Nia over the years and how you got involved with, with Nia? And sure, sure. Um, well, Nia, I got I got involved with Nia because I was looking for something to occupy myself in a healthy way. I was going through the divorce. I was going to college. I had a rock band. And I didn't want to fall down my old rabbit hole of self destructive ways and drink too much and start doing drugs again. I just I mean that's really honest. Yeah. And uh, my first time I, I kicked heroin, yoga was a big part of it. And so I was looking for a yoga class. It would be good grounding. And I found Nia. And it fulfilled everything that yoga did in the first place. And a little bit more because there was music associated with it. And I liked to dance. And so it was really good. It was like going to an adult sock hop with healthy, nice people, listening to cool music, doing cool dancing. And it was six blocks from my house. And so I pretty much moved into the, the Nia studio. And it was a great choice. And so the question was, how did I end up doing the job and what is Nia? So... Nia is, I call it a design system for sustainability in a body. Okay. Okay. The, the, uh, the model for Nia is through movement we find health. All right. My first experience that got me in that, oh my God, this is cool stuff, right? Was um, it's my seventh class. I remember it very, very well because it was my last class. Debbie Rosas, the founder of Nia, was out of town and I had a substitute teacher in class for six classes and she was fun it was great and it was cool it was awesome but it wasn't deep enough for me it was just it was just what i just described you know yeah and i'm not putting down the teacher but debbie rosas is the master and she came in and she says okay so today the focus is going to be opening the heart center we're going to do that in a variety of ways we're going to use our bodies by rolling our shoulders back like this which actually opens up it expands the cavity i don't remember how she said it but you know you can see that there's a physical thing associated with opening the heart center when you roll your shoulders back right yes it made sense to me i'm like oh that makes sense to me i'm kind of a new age guy dan yeah, I but knew that. I'm, not, I'm not over the top of new age. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So she said that visualization was also a part of it. We open our heart center, we use visualization and we use sounding, we, we vocalize. And so she explained the science behind the focus and how she was going to achieve it. And I say that because it was really important because as even though I was a, I'm a real open guy and kind of new agey and found yoga when I was 18 and Buddhism, if she would have asked me to bend down and pick up a wounded bird, heal it and set it free... I would have looked at her and went, what? And I would have walked out the door. <laughs> right. You know? But she gave me the science. And so I went, okay, I'll do that. So I did. And I could feel it. I could see it leaving my hand. And I, I, and I felt a little, you know, heart center opening, right? Yeah. Well, it had been six months since my wife and I split up. And the children went down the proverbial driveway looking out the back window with the family dog. And I had never really taken that in yet. Hmm. That night, I went home and I picked up my after class, went home, picked up my guitar, strummed one chord and cried for four days. Nia opened my heart center, that experience. 
really, really opened up for me, and I needed that cry. Yeah. And I went, wow, this is really important stuff. That's it's not, cathartic. This is, this is, is, yeah, this is not an aerobics class. Right. You know, this work is deeper than that. So what is Nia? It's an opportunity for people to move their energy in such a way as to open themselves up to their greatest potential. And that could be healing, it can be conditioning, it can be personal mastery. That means something different to everybody. And the science is, as with many other art forms, yoga or tai chi or qigong, um, these movement forms are designed for you to move your energy, spiritual, emotional, and physical energy in such a way as to not to compromise the benefits by injuring yourself. So Nia is really fun. It has great music and and it's aerobic and it's dancey and it's all these things, but you do it in your bare feet and you do it grounded and you do it with a uh, an understanding of Debbie the choreographers they create the work with an understanding to guide people through this experience in a way that they don't hurt themselves so that they can maximize the benefits of the movement which clears their what's needed at the time you know sometimes it's a physical thing sometimes it's emotional sometimes it's a spiritual thing so it's very holistic yeah. and very effective so that's Nia even why I love it it's probably one of the best commercials ever done for a uh, an exercise uh, program, or it's more than that. I know it's more than that. But well, it, no, I think exercise exercise is not inappropriate. It's right. not inappropriate because you're exercising your your human dynamic, right? Right, not just your thigh. Yeah. So, it it, it affects all you know the heart, the mind, everything. Right? Mm-hmm. There's clarity. There's you know. All that stuff. That's and great. And there's a lot of science over the last 20 years. When when they first started this thing, uh, you know, 40 years ago, um, there was no science supporting what they were doing. They created mind-body fitness. Yeah, they really did. They opened it up. This is long before yoga came into the American consciousness. Right. Long before. Debbie, yeah. Debbie and Carlos were real pioneers in that, in that regard. Um, so can you tell us about your work with Nia as far as uh, being the president of Nia? Yeah. And, and Nia Sounds as well. Well, as I said, I was a student. I, I moved in. I became a part of the family here. I remodeled the place for free classes. And at one point, um, and everybody knew what I was doing, mm-hmm. telling everybody to come to my shows and BBs come to my shows. And then they knew I was a college student and that my focus was business. And so the owners of the studio uh, at one point asked me for some business advice probably misguided on their on their part but uh i i came up with something kind of cool for them and they did it and it worked and so they you know i gained some cred in that area and then sometime later debbie and carlos of the nia program who were they were teaching classes here as i said but they didn't own the studio they had a different business model and they were looking for some help understanding how they could manage what their situation was these people suggested they talk to me and they did and so i said something that they thought was kind of smart and they adopted it and it worked for them and so they asked me another question i told them something else and it became kind of a relationship after some time they offered me a job and i didn't want to do it i was um i had a rock band (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, I had a demo that got a couple offers. I was nice. really excited. Yeah. I, was, I was on my way to doing something else. Um, and I still hadn't finished school yet. And I didn't want to work for somebody. But then they asked me again right about the time that my band broke up and the deals with the record labels didn't go through. And college was kind of coming to an end. Maybe it was almost a year later. And I realized that this was a really great opportunity. Yeah. I'd always wanted to do something more than just make money in my life. Right. And they were doing that. The work that they are doing is profound. Yeah. And I could see it. It had a transformational effect on me. And I saw it over the years of being a student, the transformational impact that it was having on not all their students, but many of them, maybe all of them to some degree and many of them in a large degree. Yeah. And I was... I just had to really reconcile that with myself and think, well, why would you not want to be a part of that? 
Right. Yeah. Because you didn't create it. And, you know, get your <laughs> ego out of the way. And uh, actually, it was probably the best conversation, if not one of the only real conversations my father and I ever had. I called him up and I said, you know, hey, Dad, I don't know what to do here. And he says, look, he says, it sounds to me like this is everything you've ever wanted to do. Why aren't you going to do it? Is it? And, you know, he identified that. And he says, it sounds to me like the only thing standing in your way is your ego. Oh, my God. That he couldn't have pushed a bigger <laughs> button, you know. He couldn't have pushed a bigger yeah, button. Yeah. I've learned to respect a lot ego a lot more yeah. as I've gotten older. But sure. at that time, I still was like, oh, no. Okay, Rosalie, do that. <laughs> so I let my ego get out of the way, and I took the job, and the rest is history. Oh, it's been 20 two years that's great that uh and i started with nia it was a seven percent of what we're doing now wow. in revenue wow. we're now 2500 teachers in 50 countries and uh it's been a real journey that's, that's incredible it is a lot of growth so yeah, yeah thank you it, it was it was um and then you asked about nia sounds yes absolutely. okay so one of the reasons that uh, i was a fit for them other than some clever insights into their business model and how they might be able to work with it mm -hmm. um, and expand it was that I had video, I'd done video, yeah. I'd done, I'd done uh, I was a creative, I'd done video, I'd done photography, and I, I knew music, mm -hmm. you know? So they produced videos to distribute routines, dance routines, because Nia is at its foundation a, a dance class. Okay. So you enter into the Nia world through a dance class. Okay. It goes deeper than that, but sure. they train teachers. We train teachers to teach Nia classes. Okay. So we provide choreography for them. Yeah. Which means I have to pick out music and then license the music. Okay. And so when I first started, we could only get sync. Mm, it was okay. really, really hard to get licensing back in those days. But yeah. sync licensing was reasonably um, easy. I mean, you couldn't get sync licensing for Fields of Gold by Sting, but you could get <laughs> sync licensing, you know, for songs. Yeah. And um, so, but then Napster came along. It really opened things up. Wow. And then people started, because yeah, I was always trying to get master and mechanical because I thought that there was an opportunity for building compilation CDs outside of the NIA market. Okay. And this is pre Buddha Bar. I was thinking this, you know. <laughs> but then when all that whole thing opened up and opened up the doors for companies like compilation CD companies like Buddha Bar and so on, um, it was a natural fit for us to expand into publishing and distribution. Okay. Okay. And so I started a side adjunct company called Nia Sounds, which was a compilation record label, the foundation of uh, which was the publishing and licensing company that licensed 40 or 50 songs a year for our routines. Okay. So yeah. these were existing songs at that time? Yes. Yeah. All right. Where were we? So we were talking about Nia Sounds and licensing. Right. So Nia Sounds was created out of my need to license music for our compilation, for the compilations that we put into our routines, and then it spun off to physical copy distribution. Okay. And then when digital distribution came along, we spun off into that. Yeah. And so now Nia Sounds is a little bit more than that because I had always had, you know, I'm a musician or a creative, and I think, you know, God, how fun would it be to have a record label, you know? And, yeah. And have artists. Definitely. Right? Well, that's really expensive, and it's really hard to do, and it's really I mean, it's not a part-time job, you know. Right. So, even though it was in the back of my head, I never really took any action on it. Okay. And, until I released an album, then I released it on Nia Sounds, and yeah, and then I have a couple of other artists on the, on the label. We haven't really developed that aspect of it. Yeah. But, you know, I got a couple of really great artists you on do. it. You do. Yeah. yeah. We've, we've a made few, some, I would say. We made some really, really fantastic uh, music, and I'm really proud of it. It was low-hanging fruit, and be disrespectful, but one of the artists is Rob Daker, who is my producer, and, you know, he made the record himself in his own studio, so it's not like as a record label says, okay, I'm going to produce you, and here's a half a million dollars, go make a record, and we're going to make a bunch of videos. Right. And the other, the artist is, is Terry Robb, 
and uh, and that record that Rob made is phenomenal. Yeah, I got it. Check really it out. Yeah. is a phenomenal record, and I'm not just saying that. This guy is so talented, and there's some songs on there that are all great, but there's a couple of real standout classics. And then Terry Robb, you know, I had the opportunity to work with Terry Robb, who's one of the he's one of the greatest living guitar players in the world. He really is, and he's yeah. respected as such. He hasn't gotten the the uh, accolades. the accolades and the cash to to match it up, but people in the industry know who Terry Robb is. He's considered the greatest acoustic blues guitar player living today. And I had the opportunity to work with him. I'm like, why wouldn't I do that? You know? And so we've, we're on our second record with Terry now. Nice. And uh, it's just been one of the greatest experiences of my life working with both of these artists. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rob is one of the best, you know, he played uh, guitar with, with Stuart when you did your big uh, Aladdin show. And yes. he well, music director. He was my producer and music director. The only way that I was going to do that show would be to to have Rob be the music director. Yeah, um, because I just that music was just so well produced. I couldn't go out there and hack it. Right. You know. Yeah. And so Rob put together the band and he did it all. He all I was did a was, great live guitar player too. I got to say. <laughs> and uh, and Terry Robb, I saw him with the Acoustic Guitar Summit do a workshop at Artichoke Music years ago. And uh, he could tell you the way that Clapton would play a lick and the way that Buddy Guy would play a lick and the way that, you know, Muddy Waters would play the same lick. And he could play it the way that anybody in the whole blues catalog could play it. And he had a, a deep knowledge of the blues, how it originated, where it went how the Mississippi River tied into all of it, you know, how Chicago became the Chicago blues and the, you know, kind of swamp blues became that kind of stuff, man. And then he also played with the uh, PG3, Portland Guitar 3, one of those concerts with Jennifer Batten and Joff Metz. And I have never seen anybody play a Stratocaster through a Marshall with no other effects and make it sound like that. Like, <laughs> I mean, Jennifer Batten with eight fingers on the fretboard of the guitar. He he was not intimidated in the least. Killing and he it. played finger style. <laughs> uh, no pick. Right. Yeah. And God, he could blaze on that thing. And, and sound soulful and sweet, you know, in the same song, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Great, great, great talent. So we had the opportunity to work with two really, really world-class artists, and so I took it. So yeah. we got a hip-hop guy as well, nice. and uh, he's he's doing really well and blowing up. But same thing, you know, he's part of the community. Yeah, Illa is his name, and his act is uh, SOXO Supreme, and has been around me since a long time. I've known him since he was a teenager. Wow. And yeah, so... Good right. stuff. Great talent. Well, and and your albums are on there as well. Well, they so the are. Stuart, how many albums have you done since Three. you started your journey with this? Three. Three albums. That's what I thought. And can you talk about the writing process with those? Well, there's some backstory to all of that. When I started working for Nia, as I said, I broke up a band, you know, yeah. a band breakup, and I was kind of tired. You know, I was in my forties. And I had done that band thing and didn't look like we were going to... It's discouraging. I mean, it it's is. It's tiring, you know? Three years of beating the streets and I had three record deals like right there happen and then just fall away. And, and, and also, I, I had to get a job. You know, my kids yeah. were getting older. And the great opportunity of Nia came along. I was really blessed that all these things happened. So I jumped into Nia with, with five feet, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I had to teach myself how to be a businessman. I had to learn. I forgot I even was a musician. I even forgot I was a musician. Seriously, my guitar sat in the case for 15 years. Oof. And other than Saturday night, playing my wife's favorite song, <laughs> you know, every once in a while. But then I, uh, I had a health issue. Okay. And so the, the demon, the, the old junkie monkey, came up and scratched me and slapped me on the face. Uh, I got hepatitis C when I was uh, 16. Oh, wow. Shooting heroin, and and I didn't respect that. And so, after, you know, I eventually got better and, and was going, leading, the doctor said, you can lead a normal life, just stop shooting heroin. But he didn't say anything about drinking or cocaine or 
you know, everything else. And uh, I've had a problem with a lifetime challenge with drug addiction. And so I just went off onto my irresponsible way. And uh, 44 years later, my body couldn't take it anymore. And I got really, really sick. Mm. And so I needed a liver transplant. And I needed to get rid of the hepatitis C. And so I went to the doctor and they took all these tests and went back to get the results of the test. And the doctor who came into the room wasn't my doctor. It was somebody else with two other people I didn't know. And they were giving me this really negative, prog- scary prognosis. You know, you, wow. you're going to die sooner than you want to, no matter how you look at this. If you don't change your lifestyle, you're going to die sooner than you can count. And even if you do, we still have to eradicate the hep C before we can get you a transplant, and that's going to be a journey. And this is before they have the miracle drugs. This was, you know, six years ago, and, and the only thing available was interferon, and I did that, and it didn't work. And But anyhow, the point is that to the story about the albums, you know, how did the creative process, yeah. you ask the question, how my creative process works. My creative process works when I'm challenged to a great de- degree. Otherwise, okay. I'm just kind of a lazy guy, you know. But, you know, so I, I, I don't I'm, see you as a lazy well, guy. I'm, I'm project oriented, yes. and I know that about okay. myself, you know. So yeah. I'm really on, or I'm a couch potato. So I challenge myself to be really on. I like that's why I like that's why my life has been around productions. Okay. You know. Yeah. Events, and I, and I excel when I do that more than I would if I wasn't, mm-hmm. you know, but so I was faced with this, this reality. And the first thing I thought of was I wanted to record some music. I hadn't played in so many years and it was such a big part of my life up to that point. And my children were so young when I stopped playing, I wanted them to have something to remember me as a musician. Yeah. And I also wanted to express myself as a musician in that time stamp, right? That makes sense. And I uh, also wanted to give a gift to my wife. So I had seen Rob a few times in that year leading up to that. And we've known each other for a long time. Not really well, but we've known each other. And so I'd seen him at a couple of events. And I remember seeing him at a friend of mine's birthday party. He came right up to me and he was like, Dude, how's it going? You got to come into the studio, man. What have you been doing, you know? And uh, cuz that's I, that's how I met him was mm-hmm. back when I was in that other band. And then I don't know, a couple of months later, Dan Reed was in town and was at his show and he invited me over to the studio the next day and I went over to hang out and had a really good time and got to see Rob working, you know, in his producing environment and his producing hat. And I went, "Wow, you know, this is really comfortable. I feel pretty good around. I could, you know, I, I could see that but I didn't have any real motive you know I just really put it out you yeah. know I had just put it out and then when I got sick it, it was right in the forefront of my of my mind and I walked out of the doctor's office sat in the car and called Rob up and asked him if he had time for me to come in and do three songs one for me one for my kids and one, one for my wife so that's how that started your question is you know how does the creative process work for me yeah. uh, with an alarm fire <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that works really well for me. In the old days when I was writing songs, there was one song that took me two years to write. Okay. Literally. Yeah. And it's, I don't know how to describe it. It was, it was a different process this time. Okay. I, I did three albums in four years. Wow. That's really fast. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it was because of the new creative process that I created in the dynamic of working with Rob Daker. Mm-hmm. Rob's an, an exceptional producer just on his own everything that he does is out of this world world class and just the highest production quality but he's also an excellent producer in that he has great bedside manner I guess you could say sure you know he knows how to read artists really well and then bring out help them reach their expression okay and that worked really really well for me especially at the time that I was going through healing yeah so when I wasn't in the studio I really wasn't thinking about writing songs and so I did my three songs and then the rest of the songs most of the rest of the songs I guess I could say all of them I wrote in the studio okay and so I'd walk in with no idea of what I was going to do maybe an idea sometimes I had a a sentence sometimes I had a title sometimes I had nothing Uh, sometimes I just had a feeling I I would always have to create something because Rob would say um, you know so what are we going to do today and I'd say I don't know but you have to give something on you know what kind of canvas are you going to paint on okay right yeah, you know yeah. are you going to use acrylic are you going to use oil are you yeah. going to you know are you going to do? I say okay so you know let's do something about 120 i haven't done anything in the key of b ever so let's try that and you know 
something happy or something bluesy or or else I'd say uh, I have a title like uh, branded on my soul was it was an example of a I just uh, texted and sent a text and in that text I said branded on my soul and I looked at it was sitting in the driveway <laughs> of the studio right <laughs> and I had no idea what I was going to do I walked in around what are we going to do today and I said I don't know but it's going to be called branded on my soul <laughs> <laughs> I love working like that and I really need I would love to be able to recreate that on my own but it really helps to have a producer well, to have Rob Dacre sitting there. And oh, yeah, it really helps me to have somebody in that role. I'd never had anybody in that role. I'd never had a partner. I'd never had a friend. Or, you know, it wasn't that guy who started a band when I was a kid and had a buddy. Then we were just like all passionate about it together. I never had that. It was always me leading it, you know? Yeah. And so you always have that kind of apprehension of, do they really like my music? Or are they just doing this because there's nothing else to do? You don't really know, you know? But having the freedom to create in the environment that Rob created for me, mm -hmm. and he does for his other artists, I'm sure, was a real gift. Yeah. And also to have him sitting there looking at me like he says, okay, go sing something. I haven't written any words yet. And so, <laughs> and, and, you know, the producer who you respect, who's yeah. also your friend, who you're also paying, is sitting there looking at you. <laughs> you got to fucking sing something, yeah. you know? And, and it's got to be meaningful. <laughs> you know, you got to dig deep to go, yeah. okay, let me think. And so you start scatting, and the next thing you know, something pops out, and you go, okay, I'm going down that rabbit hole. Yeah. You, know, you don't have any time to think about anything else. You can't second guess yourself right. you can't talk yourself out of it you know yeah. and you keep doing it until he goes i like that that's good you know so he <laughs> becomes your he becomes your it's okay guy the sounding you know? board yeah, yeah the yeah. sounding board yeah. there's a beautiful a beautiful dynamic and it worked really really well for me and um i couldn't have done it otherwise yeah there's no no question three albums in four years is a lot especially for running a you know 2500 person company <laughs> right. and, and three years of that i was i was going through my treatment Ooh, wow so most of that time you were going through your treatment for hep C, right, right? Right. Anything else you want to talk about in this area? Before we move on, oh, to you know, I think it's one of my favorite. It's, it's yeah. one of the favorite parts of my life. Yeah. That, that that dynamic of working with Rob in such a way. I've never worked with a producer. I've worked with engineers. Mm -hmm. I've never done a lot of recording before, anyways. I think the only thing I did was six experiences in a professional studio with okay. a great engineer who wasn't a really good friend of mine. He wasn't really a producer, but he, he played the role really well. Mike Demers was his name, and Mike was a real gift for me. Yeah. Uh, but that was my only experience, and that was many, many years before the Rob experience. Yeah. Working with Rob, I felt like it was really a high level of, of, of professionalism. It just worked freaking well for me yeah and it was fun it was inspiring it's a kick you know you go in and you ain't got nothing going and eight hours later you walk out and you go damn yeah i got a song and three days later it's mixed and done it was really really exciting and a great song you have a lot of great songs oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah i appreciate that believe me i i arranged strings for that one album that and, and uh i i had spent a lot of time listening to those songs and they are really well done so you, yeah good you stuff. did good you stuff. did yeah, yeah you were really intimately involved with uh, uh a lot of them definitely you did charts yeah can you tell us about Stuart fm Stuart.fm is my website my artistic name is Stuart. It's also my nickname, and it's been my nickname my whole life. I hated it as a kid. <laughs> I hated it. I hated it until I was, it was suggested to a band member. We were picking a name for the band, the new band, and the drummer says, you know, so why don't we call it Stuart? And I'm like, why would we do that? And he says, it's because it's your name. And I said, no, it's not. You know, my name's <laughs> Jeff. I hate it when people call me Stuart. I didn't tell him that, but, you know, everybody was calling me Stuart for lots of different reasons. Sure. Uh, military bases, boarding school. Uh, there was uh, my sister married a guy named Jeff. Uh, it's just, you know, there was just one thing after another. People always gravitated towards calling me Stuart. They called my dad Stu. And so... Everybody went, yeah, that's a great idea. You know, Stuart Sting, you know, it works, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Madonna. And I went, okay. So I adopted the name Stuart as my, you know, embraced it as a professional moniker. Okay, yeah. And so then when I released this album, 
the first album with Rob, yeah, I'm putting it on my label. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw some guns after it because I was impressed. Yeah, I liked it, you know. Yeah. And uh, you have to start there. Yeah, right. And I had the means. I have a distribution company. It wasn't like a big stretch for me to do that. You know, you yeah. press us some records and take out some Instagram ads. Big deal, right? But you have to do a website, and I couldn't get Stuart because it's a town in Florida, and there's all kinds of other people. Even on even now today, when you go to iTunes, you put in Stuart, I get Marty Stewart. You know? <laughs> It's, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. <laughs> so, so I got the URL, Stuart.fm. Okay. And so as a unifying marketing branding thing, on Spotify, I'm Stuart.fm. On Instagram, I'm Stuart.fm. So Stuart.fm is not my name, but right. it's the way people can find me. Okay. And go. professionally, I'm known as Stuart. And also... Personally, you know, everybody calls me Stuart. There you go. All right. <laughs> Stuart.fm, folks. I have to admit that, you know, I don't ever do anything without expecting to make it to the bottom of the hill. You know? <laughs> when, I, when, I go off the, when I go off the lip of the black diamond, I don't care how icy it is, man. I'm going to make it to the bottom. And making it to the bottom for me is Madison Square Garden. I'm going to have a success. I'm going to sell some records. I'm going to go on tour. And this is going to work for me. And so I just imagine so many times, you know, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome to the stage Stuart dot FM. Dot <laughs> FM is my last name, you know. <laughs> and I come out and go, no, man. It's a <laughs> Do you have a routine or a process that helped you to accomplish your best work? Discipline. Okay. Yeah. Dis discipline is the key to, like they say, what um, actors say that, you know, and people talk about actors. I've heard this said that, you know, yeah, he was in character the entire time. Right. He was on set. You know, he'd walk on set and he was, and then the wife says, are you kidding on set? He was, he was you know, he was making love to me with an accent, you know, right? Right. The, the, right. the, the method actor, they just totally yeah. immerse themselves in that. And so when I was working, and I do that, that's why I gave up my guitar for Nia, because I became a businessman. I right. started wearing suits, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, recording these songs, going through this album experience, as much as I could, as I was working my... My job, which I had a certain amount of freedom to do less and more creatively during that time because I was going through a big life change, you know, yeah. it was, uh, it was healing. And the, how actors immerse themselves in a role, right? So I, I make the shift from being a businessman into making records, you know, and I want to make records at the highest level that I can. Yeah. And so what does that mean? I became a rock star, <laughs> you know, as much as I could. Yeah. You know, I walked it, I talked it. It wasn't like I had to go out and buy stuff. I have a whole closet full of things that I hadn't been wearing for years. I got the same cowboy boots I've been had since I was 25. <laughs> you know, I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, and uh, I got in really good shape. I was doing 100 push-ups a day. I was eating super healthy, making all my own food and drinking lots of water and just becoming part of the creative process in every cell of my body, whatever that meant to me embracing that in every way that I could. That's was a big part of it for me. I think it served you really well. It, it's all part of the discipline. Yeah. You know, so um, the discipline isn't just practicing your instrument. The, instru right. the, the discipline is to practice everything that goes along with creating the reality of which you vision. Well put. What are some important tips you could give to aspiring artists, business leaders, and musicians and because you do film and photography and music and business whole bunch of cool stuff well i think the key to creativity is freedom and i've said that before and i say it all the time i say that to people i work with and i say it to myself and and that's that's not just freedom like you know you're a musician you have the freedom to go into a recording studio and, and make records you know right. that's the emotional freedom and spiritual freedom and financial freedom and uh, you know freedom to have the right tools and and uh having the right people around you creates a, a dynamic of freedom um and having the biggest obstacle to freedom is self-confidence okay and I think that's, I know that that's my biggest journey. Yeah. I still struggle with that daily, momentarily. And I think that a lot of people do. I think it's the biggest barrier to people reaching their greatness and, and finding, you know, that thing that fulfills them, okay. that, their, their unique purpose. Yeah. And so I tell myself, 
<laughs> and anybody else who listen that it's really the silliest thing in the world because nobody cares. You know, nobody's watching you and paying attention, right? Right. So the only person who's judging you is you. And if there are people judging you, you don't care about those people anyways because they're so bored with their life that they have to spend time judging you, you know, <laughs> or, or whatever. You know how it yeah. is, right? Um, haters got to hate, judges got to judge. And you don't want to have anything to do with those people because yeah, you're never going to see them again. And even <laughs> if you do, who cares? Because the only thing that matters is you caring. And, you know, I know it sounds easy and I know it's not because I still struggle with it. Yeah. But I think that's the key. Do you think that's why people get in their own way is because they care? There is that sort of like, I care about the results here, so I'm going to second guess everything and try to perfect. Because I think perfectionism gets in the way of creativity and in, in the way of progress all the time. For some people, I think it's different for everybody. And uh, I think that that can be a, a, a real legitimate dynamic. Mm -hmm. But I also have seen people use that as an excuse because of their own uh, low self-esteem. You know? Right. Okay. Like, so when we, we can't admit that the real barrier is that I don't trust myself, I don't believe in myself, and I'll never be good enough, mm -hmm. then we create lies to make it okay for us not to say that. Okay. Somebody told me one time that the degree to which we regret our position is the degree to which we distort reality to support it. So that's a yeah. really simple statement, but it really is, it can manifest itself in our lives in really complicated ways. Now, I've known that sentence for most of my life. And I do that all day, every day, mm -hmm. even though I'm consciously aware of it. So the guy that told me that said, you know, this is one of the most important psychological rules that people just don't really know. So as, using that as a descriptive of saying, are people standing in the way of their creativity by being perfectionist? Well, maybe they're using perfectionism to justify their lack of self-esteem. Okay. And self confidence, mm -hmm. right? So they never finish the album because they don't trust that the album's good. Right. Right. It's not because they're a perfectionist. Right. But there are perfectionists. <laughs> there are. There, there are that. Well, For me, it was it was always um, low self esteem. Okay. Non perfectionism. I'm definitely not a perfectionist. I've heard it said uh, anything worth doing is worth doing wrong until you develop the skills to do it right. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that's true. It, it sounds good, though. I think it's all true. <laughs> I, I think true. it's all true. You know, there are 7 billion people on the planet, and we all have 7 billion little dynamics in our personality, and you mix that all together, and, it, and it's all true, yeah. you know? Yeah. You have to find out what's true for yourself. For me, I try to boil it down to the lowest common denominator. Okay. They try to keep it really simple. Simple, yeah. And, um, yeah. Okay. So did the uh, place and time that you grew up or places did that affect how you learn oh very much yeah very much yeah this is really fun for me <laughs> uh, and, and, fun yeah, for me too. and one of the reasons it's fun for me is because i've reached a certain age you know i can i can answer these things with a certain amount of of understanding sure you know because i have lots of years of insight and i've been struggling with my human dynamic just like everybody does all these years and i've learned a lot and so um so my dad was uh, real critical and he wasn't very loving, and he wasn't very communicative, and everybody in our family is still struggling from that. My dad was a great guy. He, was, he loved us very much, but he just didn't have really good parenting skills. Okay. And so, you know, I, I grew up hearing, you know, what the hell's the matter with you? What's wrong with you? And I come up with something, I, I mean, I was just the same as I am now. You know, I mean, I was a hard kid to deal with, man. I was bouncing off walls. I had an idea, a volcano of ideas, you know, constantly. It was very frustrating for my dad. And it yeah. was always, what are you talking about? Relax. You know, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. And so. It's a lot. Yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah. Right. And so, um, and I think a lot of people get that. I think certainly in my generation and, uh, you know, my parents grew up in the depression, you know, and it was a struggle for him. It was a struggle for me because I believed him, you know, mm. and I still do. You know, that kind of scar tissue, that kind of trauma that stays with you your whole life. So you ask me, does the dynamics of your childhood have an effect on how you live your life as an adult? Well, absolutely. Yeah. And since the key to creativity is freedom, loving yourself and respecting yourself and trusting that what you do um, is worthy, that's freedom. And, and if you have that little voice in the back of your head saying, what's wrong with you? You can't do that. You're never going to write a song as good as David Bowie or John Lennon. Well, why not? Right. You know, Bowie wrote great songs after John Lennon. Yeah. 
you know? <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Ed Sheeran's writing songs long. At, I mean, there's yeah. great art everywhere. I mean, it's yeah. just ridiculous. I can pull names out, and it doesn't matter what names I pull out because it's just random. It's just bullshit. And I hear great artists everywhere Yeah. and see great art everywhere and there's no reason even to judge it because if it's authentic it's great you know i like that in order to create art we have to get out of our own way that's right so that's what i think is yeah. the biggest barrier to creating a, a life of passion and authenticity is us yeah what mentors did you have along the way that come to mind i had a lot of them yeah I, i've always gravitated towards wise knowledgeable people the first one was the yoga teacher that was part of the program when i was kicking heroin the first time when I was 17 and his name was Joe and Joe really changed my life. He taught me about yoga and he was a spiritual yoga teacher. He was a Buddhist guy. Um, not that I became a Buddhist, but not that I didn't become a Buddhist either, but you know, he gave me a, a way of looking at life that has influenced me to today. And so he was the first. And then over the years, there was there was many. I had business mentors and musical mentors. I have a mentor now. I think it's important. I, I think so, too. Yeah. I think so, too. And I like to, I'm always available for that, too. I think all the listeners will be. Uh, well, <laughs> and there might be people in my life that go, what, are you kidding me? But I, I think it's really important. You yeah. know, I, I think that human connection and sharing wisdom and sharing inspiration, that's the cycle of life. And yeah. I feel responsible to be a part of it. Well, I think you once told me uh, there's 7 billion people on the planet and we're all in this together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, you know, like, it, keeping things simple for me yeah. and, and, and pragmatic, it helps me a lot because yeah. I, I have kind of a complicated brain and yeah I don't remember where that came from but <laughs> I think it was like driving down on Los Angeles freeway one day and I was just you know get, getting pissed off at people and stuff and I was going what are you kidding me I can't even believe we get along as well as we do right with 7 billion people on the planet you know yeah and everybody's so different, so diverse, and everybody wanting the same thing, you know. We're all trying to get through that one funnel of opportunity, <laughs> right, in so many different directions and so many different ways. I find it really fascinating. That is the kind of the human condition, isn't it? We're, you know, we all want the same thing, but we're all different, and we're trying to find our own way to achieve creating art, creating things being cared for, caring for people, giving, receiving, all that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, these are the little components of life, right? I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think we're all looking for, well, I wrote a song about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a song about it. But we're all looking for purpose. We're all looking for meaning in yeah. life. Uh, not all of us. You know, there, there are people who don't really care. Right. I believe that. They they really are on automatic pilot and they don't they don't care and that's okay you know but I think for the most part the people are looking for something to justify validate and inspire their lives. When I was going to Europe, you gave me some advice about when there is a doubt, there is no doubt. Can you t <laughs> can you tell us about what that means, Jeff? I don't know why I said that to you. I know why I said it to my children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like I would say to my daughter when she's going out on a date, you know, when there's doubt, there's no doubt, right? You know, so if your friends are going to invite you to a party after the party after the party and you're thinking, you know, I should probably go home. You should probably go home. Yeah. You know, or I've broken my leg twice skiing and it was on the last run where I hesitated before I went up and did it. Mm -hmm. I had doubt whether or not I should take the last run and I did and I broke my freaking leg. You know, and so um, that's probably why I told you, because you're going off on this adventure through Europe and yeah. Eastern Europe yeah. and all of that. And I just was like saying, Danny, take care of yourself. You yeah. know, always remember when there's doubt, there's no doubt. Well, don't second guess yourself. Who knows how much that helped me? Because I only had one moment of doubt on the whole trip and I was getting off of a train when the train was ending in the Netherlands. And these guys are like, oh, the next train's upstairs. You should go with us. We'll you know, we'll show you where it is. And I'm like, uh, it doesn't sound right. Cause I had talked to another guy just a little bit before who's like, you stay on this train, but they're like, the train's stopping here. It's the last stop for the train. I'm like, how do I stay on the train? And right. Yeah. So anyways, so I get off the train and these guys are like, yeah, come with us. We'll, we'll help you. I have my guitar and everything right. with me and I very well could have lost that stuff. And right. who knows what that night 
then the other do? guy gets off the train and yeah. goes, what are you doing? The front of the train keeps going. The back of the train stops here. Go up to the front. I'm like, cool. <laughs> so I'm like, thank you, Stuart. That's amazing. You remember that. It's yeah. really flattering. <laughs> I'm glad you took it to heart. Yeah. Well, maybe other people will too, and that'll help them too. So, yeah. <laughs> so how should people find their passion and start their creative lives? Trust themselves. Trust themselves. That's good. Yeah, trust your instincts and, and do it from an early, do it as soon as you possibly can. Yeah. You know, uh, it's no time wasting. Yeah. You know, and, and the sooner you get it, the more opportunities you're going to have. Okay. And the deeper you're going to go. Get out of your way. Forget about it. Life ain't serious, you know, unless you make it serious. Right. But it's your life. Right. And nobody's going to get in your way. You're the only one that's going to get in your way. And nobody cares. I think I said that earlier. Yeah. You know, nobody cares. <laughs> you know, they they say they care and they they mean it. You know, I mean, your mother cares. You yes. know, I care. I right. care about you, Danny. <laughs> but you know, I'm right not so going to judge you. You right. know, um, and uh, we're our we're our greatest critic and and our greatest barrier to finding that that place where we sail with our purpose. Nice. Sounds like you put some thought into that. Might turn that into lyrics if they're not already. <laughs> Good. How has technology changed the writing process and creative arts in general over the years? Tremendously. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it tremendously. The, the idea of a scratch pad, <laughs> I mean, it's digital, you know, it's yeah. so fast. Um, I think about photography, I used to do shoots and take 200 pictures. And it, <laughs> it was a big deal, you know. It's a lot to pictures. develop. <laughs> yeah, right? 200 yeah. pictures, right? You know, that's like, uh, you know, six rolls, right? And uh, But now I take 2,000. Such a difference, right. isn't it? Right. And, and, and edit, it's easy. And, and, and edit 2,000 pictures in like four, we're well, not edit, but select, right. you know, the select so make, the the, make the, the select the gems in four hours. And, uh, you know, before you have 200 pictures, and it would take an entire day. Yeah. to develop them, to get to the point where you could even make some selections. And as far as songwriting goes, yeah, we can, I, 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 can, I can do five versions of lyrics, just scatter them off the top of my head and cut and paste them and put them together and have a song. Wow, yeah. yeah right? Yeah. Instead of writing them down and trying to figure it all out, <laughs> you, you, just, you just go, okay, so here's a rough arrangement and here's a rough rhythm track. And I have a rough idea of where I want to go with the melody, and I have a rough idea where I'm going to go with the vocals. And you just you, you, you just can scat it out, you know, five different times and sit back and listen to it and go, okay, well, that's good, that's good, that's good. doesn't mean that that's what you're going to take, but it really facilitates the creative process in a, in a really fun and elegant way. Yeah, it allows you to work in a flow as opposed to, you know, Absolutely. a clunky way. Absolutely. Yeah. And you don't get tired. Yeah. It's not exhausting. You're not beating yourself up. It's 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 really different. Uh, if I say the two words second chance, what are some stories that come to mind or a story? My whole think? life. Yeah. <laughs> Each day, right? Every day. <laughs> And, you know, and I don't know, I think that for me, and I don't want, uh, you know, I'm really resistant to set myself apart from everybody because everybody has the same struggles. We just find them in different ways. Sure. You know, I think, you know, I've known very few people in my life that I went, that guy's never struggled. <laughs> you know, I have right. known those people. Yeah. And, and I could be wrong. Maybe they're struggling inside. I don't know. That could be. But, there, you know, I, I think there are people who have golden tickets, you know, certainly. But I ain't one of them. Yeah. And, uh... You know, I kicked heroin twice. I, you know, I've had a big struggle for 16 years with, you know, d drug culture. And, and then my health yeah. suffered because of it. They said I was going to die without a liver transplant. And I'm not completely healed, of course, but I'm living. Yeah. You know, I, I lived past their expectations and I didn't get a transplant. And they healed my hepatitis C. That was certainly a second chance. I think I've gotten so many second chances in so many ways other than women yeah that I never had a woman give me a second chance <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a tough one i'm not even gonna touch I that one even yeah, know yeah. If, you want it. if you need a second chance with a woman it's probably best you don't take it right <laughs> or in a relationship i meant to say right, yeah, right right in our new world that's right what is your favorite and the worst part about arts and business uh, favorite and worst parts about arts and business I don't think that business and art are really different I think they're both creative okay you know yeah. um, we're always we're always having to make decisions we're having to create um, 
ways things work, you know. Today, I spend a lot of time, today was the business, my business hat was on all day, and it was about creating a communication mechanism that would best inspire my constituency to operate in a certain way. So it was all about communication and yeah. creating a communication thread that would be most broadly accepted for a very diverse market that's very creative yeah you know it has and, to be <laughs> yeah right you know and you put together you put together an alliance between companies and people you have to be very creative and you have to look at it that way so so the question is rephrase the question for me sure uh f your favorite parts about arts and business and then your least favorite parts about arts. the creativity okay the creativity is my favorite part yeah being, being challenged to solve a problem mm -hmm. and in, in writing a song you're solving a problem the melody's not working. You're going to solve the problem. The beat isn't working with the melody. You're solving a problem. Yeah. And uh, when all the problems are solved, you're done with the song. Okay. You know? Yeah. And it's the same thing with business. Okay. But it's also the worst part. And, and, and I think that the, um, the, the worst part is when you feel constricted in some way. Okay. You know, yeah. there's, there's, there's something that's keeping you from being able to make it to compromising or restricting your freedom. Okay. Right? Yeah. And um, so then that becomes a loop. Because you know, if you if you if you're really confident and you really understand that dynamic, then when you find that thing that challenges you that you don't have the tool for, you know, some guys will have a story. I okay. like to tell stories, metaphors to a fault. But anyhow, <laughs> this is this is a good one. So you know, the MacGyver guy, right? Yeah. You know, so of some of us are MacGyvers and some of us aren't. You yeah. know, and I really, you know, I think I am in some ways, but some guys are sure. in other ways. You know, so um, I was. Uh, Coming back from, I was on road tripping with a with a friend of mine, and uh, the truck broke down, and it was uh, the vacuum pump that that broke, and uh, it was in a really old truck. Okay, you know, so it wasn't one of these new fandangled things. You know, here we are on the side of the road. We had no money, no water. We had nothing, and a broken down vehicle and everything I owned in the back of the truck. And uh, he made one. He made one. He made one. Wow. Yeah. He found some rubber on the side of the road. He just started walking around. I'm going, Colin, what are you doing? And he says, something. So he said, I love this guy. <laughs> right? I named my son after him. I love him so much, right? <laughs> hey, what are you doing? Something. I have another story that supports that too. Okay. Um, something. Doing yeah. something. So when you get stuck, do something. Don't okay. ever allow yourself to be stuck. So there's a little more of that story. Yeah, yeah. Doing something and, uh, you know, I'm not just going to sit there on the side of the road and, and get pissed like you are. I'm going to do something. So he found the parts that he needed to make a vacuum that worked well enough to get us to the next town. Wow. That's awesome. It was freaking brilliant. <laughs> you know, it was just so impressive. And uh, one time I was, uh, one time I had a little business and I was failing. Uh, uh, and uh, I failed, but it was in the it was in the failing process. Okay. And part of the part of the business was I was sharing an office with some really successful people, and um, their secretary. Um, her name was Sandy, and she wasn't my secretary. I was just in the office space, right? But we became friends. And as my business was failing, she comes to my office door one day, and she stands in the door, and she says, so "How's it going, Stuart?" And I went. Not so well, Sandy. And she says, I know, it's tough. And she says, so what are you going to do? And I said, I, I don't know. And she says, Stuart, do something. It doesn't matter. Right. Just do something. But sitting there, wondering what you're going to do, it ain't going to help. Right. That's good advice. Yeah, Especially so. when you get it at the time that you need it. You know, you need to hear that. There's uh, there's another spin on that, that the the joke, don't just do something, stand there, you know? When people say that, you know, don't just do something, stand there, right? Because right. that sounds backwards, right? Uh, you know who Seth Godin is, I assume? Sure. Yeah, yeah. He has a podcast, and uh, he did a spin on that, which was, don't just do something, stand there. But when, sometimes when people are doing something, it's not the right thing, and they haven't thought about what it is that they should be doing <laughs> at all. Yeah, Because they're just flailing, you know? Right. 
It's like uh, trying to trying to be in the boxing ring against Muhammad Ali and just throwing your fists. <laughs> you got to have some kind of strategy or something. Cause, uh, well, with with, uh, with all good lessons, there's yes. balance. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. There, there's absolutely but, balance. But you're absolutely right. Because um, I had a failing eBay business mm-hmm. uh, I, where I rented a warehouse and the overhead was too much, and uh, and I needed to make decisions and I needed to do it fast. And I needed to get out in the most elegant way possible mm-hmm. and, and cut my overhead mm-hmm. way back. And I was able to do that with some help from some friends, <laughs> you know. Right. And then I was able to pay them back. Um, right on. And uh, so, yeah, sometimes you got to you gotta just do something. Right. And uh, I think we learn a lot from those experiences. Uh, that's one of the questions that Tim Ferriss asks on his podcast. Do you have a favorite failure? of yours because usually it's that failure that is the catalyst to something that was sort of one of the better parts of your life well i do i have a favorite failure and that was my favorite failure yeah um that business and it wasn't because it was a catalyst to something so great in my life other than learning something about myself that i really value yeah and that is, um, well, at least at that time, mm-hmm. you know, that uh, what I did, so I took and, and what I do, and mm-hmm. I do this habitually. You know, I'm in, I'm in with all five feet. That's the way I do everything. And, and I don't quit, and, it, and almost to a fault, but certainly to a fault. But to a fault in one degree, but to a benefit in another degree, right? right? So, so in this situation, I took it down to where I had no money. I had two children at home. I had no money. I really believed in this. I had no money. I had a van, carpenter tools, and gas money, and a full tank of gas when I walked away from that business. And um, so I told my wife, I'm not coming home until I have a paycheck. And, and I literally did that. I, I drove until I had no gas in the car. And I was at a construction site, and the guy said, uh, you know, we don't need anybody. And I had no gas, literally. I mean, I had enough gas to get somewhere, but yeah. not, like, go drive around looking for a job, you know? Right. And uh, so I'm looking at this job site, and it's like they were building, like, 500-unit apartments. You know, there were guys walking all over the place. And the guy's saying he doesn't need me. And what, are you kidding me, you know? So um, I walked around and talked to some guys, and I created a job for myself. There you go. And I went to the guy and I challenged him and uh, he went, okay, you know, yeah, if you can do that, go do it. And so I went and did it. And uh, I like that about myself. Yeah. You know? I like that I didn't stop, that I didn't get depressed. And I just, and, and I just, and I just, I just kept doing it, you know? You created an yeah, opportunity. I don't, I don't, I don't cry when it's raining on the ski slope. When I, I ski, you know, I'm yeah. up there to ski. I'm here to live. I'm here to get a job to support my family. I slept on that job site for two weeks. Ooh. Yeah, ate hot dogs at Seven Eleven, donuts and hot dogs, coffee and beer, and uh, so I got my paycheck. Yeah, but you did it. And I, yeah, and and I learned something about myself. Did it open up great opportunities for me? No, but it 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 it, it gave me a sense of confidence in my character that I didn't have before. That's good. Yeah. yeah, I can go that deep, and I'll be okay. Yeah, that's that's really good for people to know about themselves. It is. It is. And if we can learn things from other people. <laughs> instead of having to experience them, you know. Hallelujah. Thank you for that story. Is creativity or skill more important as an artist? Creativity. Yeah, and, sk- skill you can learn, creativity you can't. And then how does a person balance life, family, creativity, and their arts and business for that matter? Wow, that is a, that is, that's a big challenge for everybody, I yeah. think. And I think that I really don't know if there's an answer for that. I have I have relationships with that in many different ways. What was it? Oh, I just watched The Green Book on a plane yesterday. And the guy said, uh, did you see the movie? I saw okay, it, yeah. So the driver asked the musician, he says, um, so you got a family? And he said, no. And the, in the story, as it ended up, he said, uh, I couldn't figure out a way to be a husband and a musician. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So, no. Sometimes you can't balance it. Sometimes you have to make a really hard decision. Yeah. And um, and Jimmy Iovine says that uh, it's easy to be a successful musician. It's not a part-time job, right? It's not. Right. And so you make sacrifices. Yeah. And, you know, not everybody's Keith Richards. Right. (laughs) <laughs> right? I mean, lucky bastard, right? <laughs> He's got the same wife his entire life and 
10 kids or whatever. You know, I don't know. But, don't you know, know. It, it, he's he's done a pretty good job of balancing that. I'd watched the documentary. And okay. It was pretty inspiring, you know, how yeah. he did that. But it, it's really challenging. And uh, businessmen suffer all the time, you yeah. know. They, what's that story, you know? Yeah, my dad provided great for me except for time. Yeah. You know, and I don't know how, I don't know what the answer is to that. I have seen people be very successful in doing that. I don't know what their secret was. <laughs> I really don't, Danny. It's uh, not often, though. I haven't been. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's, it's not, those aren't easy questions. That's not an easy conversation, but I think it's more impactful that way. And I think it means something because we're all in this together, right? We're all in this together. And I think the most important thing is you, right? Yeah. So the person who's honest with them, that's how you balance it, is you're yeah. honest, mm -hmm. right? You tell your kid, you know, look, I love you a lot, but I'm not really good at baseball, and I'm not really good at playing with toys, or, you know what I mean? You don't yeah. say that to a kid, but you, you know, you be honest with yourself and the people in your life. Say, you know what I do really well? Make money, sell cars. I do that really well. And it's really inspiring to me. And I'm going to be the best person for you if I'm the best person for me. Yeah. And, and to be okay with that. I think, I think that's really true. And I think it helps people to know that, but it also means that they have to make sometimes hard decisions. You know? We all have to yeah. make sacrifices yeah. in life. Yeah. And as long as we keep them um, in the right place, mm -hmm. it makes it easier for us to do that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I do that because I'm really good at it. And it makes me feel good about myself so that I can show up for you 100% when I am yeah. here to show up for you. Be present. Yeah. yeah. And as long as everybody's honest, then there's no anger and, you know, and whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just thinking about some of the most successful people I know. And, um, you know, there's just, there's no real common thread. Right. Except for maybe <laughs> that, you know, except yeah. for being happy and honest and, and, uh, yeah. How have you learned to overcome adversity in life? I have a gift not to see adversity in the lens of adversity. Okay. Tell it, me more. Well. We, we got to know about this. Well, it's just a matter, it's, it's, once you commit to a trajectory. Yeah. Whatever comes along your way, that's just part of that trajectory. You know, okay. think about sailing across the ocean, right? Right. right. You're, you're in a 40-foot boat, you're all by yourself, and you're going to sail from here to Hawaii, right? And certainly you know that there's going to be some rainy days, you know, right. there's going to be some heavy wind that's going to take you off, there's going to be some headwinds that's going to take you off. These are all expected things, you know. But, uh, you know, maybe you didn't expect something, and it's an adversity, and you all of a sudden you're off course and you don't have any food. You don't think about it. You find food. Right. You figure it out. When you go off the lip of a black diamond on an icy day and it's sleeting and there's no visibility, you went off the lip. You don't <laughs> think about it. You, you're going to do everything you can to get to the bottom of the hill. So when you make a decision, you commit to the decision and you don't look back. You see it through. Yeah. yeah. I used to tell my kids when I was, when I was raising my kids and I used to, we used to play chase around the yard and stuff, you know. You know how little kids are, right? You know, yeah, yeah, so. You're playing tag and they're always looking for you like that. <laughs> and I used to tell my kids, I said, don't look back. I said, when somebody's chasing you, you just you just run. You just look forward. <laughs> you run till you can't run anymore. And then you get up and run some more, you know. <laughs> don't look back, right? Yeah. And uh, so I think that kind of ties in, right? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. And, and I've always been that way my whole life. Yeah, forward-looking. Without even thinking about it, yeah. It's, that's big. If you were stranded on a desert island and had to write two full-length albums to get back and you could choose anyone to be your writing partner from any point in history, who would you choose? Oh, wow. And what age would they be when you chose them? Wow, what a great question. <laughs> My Lord. I know, because you would say Rob Daker if it was your current experience, I would guess. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, a writing partner and a writing coach are different things. True. You know, Lennon and McCartney were writing partners. Yes. Right? Rob and I aren't writing partners. Okay. You know, I mean, Rob certainly contributes to melodies and he contributes to the song. And some people might consider him a writing partner. But if you asked Rob Daker if he was my writing partner, he would say, no, I'm his producer. I facilitate his process. Okay. So, yes, he's a writing partner. But when you say a songwriting partner, I'm thinking Lennon and McCartney, yeah. that kind of yeah. thing. That's what you're asking, yeah. right? 
right. Okay. I would say Bowie at the beginning. Okay. So Bowie with the 12 string on the variety show or whatever it was when he first, nobody knew who he was. Right? Uh, back when he had that big mansion and there was nobody <laughs> living in it. It was right when he was just first starting, you know. Um, I would have liked to I think that if I was living there with him at that time, he and I would have made some great music. Cool. Yeah. We, we approached things it was a similar kind of thread, I think. Okay. I mean, yeah. that might be a little lofty for me to put myself in the same room <laughs> as wow. David Bowie. Yeah. Um, and my it's songs right. don't sound anything like his, but yeah. you asked me a question, I had to come up with an answer. And uh, let me see if there's another one. So all the guys I pick are, are so great on their own, you know. Right. <laughs> they certainly didn't need Stuart along the path. But I think Bruce Springsteen and I would have been pretty there good friends. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I think we've been pretty good friends. Definitely. You know. Yeah. I love that. What a great songwriter, too. Springsteen? Yeah. Well, all of them are. Yeah, Bowie yeah. was. Um, yeah. I, I, Bowie was, I put Bowie into the songwriting performer category. Sure. I put Springsteen into, certainly he's a performer. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think that Bruce Springsteen, uh, I've said this before, I think Bruce Springsteen is underrated as a, as a, as a songwriter. Yeah, I really do. Yeah. I, I think the Tunnel of Love is one of the greatest masterpieces of our lifetime. I think Bruce Springsteen is one of the greatest folk artists of our generation. He really could tell a story in three minutes and yeah. in a way that I didn't appreciate for most of my life. You right. know? Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah, I put him up there with Dylan. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the fact that you can say so much by only giving you, you know, six words, but this is the introduction. <laughs> You know, five or six more words. Here's the middle. <laughs> I mean, it's it's incredible. It yeah. kills me. Yeah, yeah. It kills me. Yeah. Walk like a man. I just every time I listen to that song, I go, who writes this shit? Uh -huh. <laughs> Springsteen does. You yeah. Know? One yeah. step up and two steps back is right. like uh, there was a whole, an entire, like, I want to say it was a two or three hour workshop at a songwriting camp that I went to mm -hmm. based on that, entirely on that song, mm -hmm. taking apart the lyrics and looking at all that was being said in the first sentence, you know, and, and how each word choice was so impactful. <laughs> it's like, and he probably wrote that in about five minutes, <laughs> you know. Right? Right. Because it's in his DNA. Yeah. You know, his method of communicating had been developed to such a degree at that point. Okay. I, I'm noticing that with my writing now, not my songwriting, but I also write. Yeah. And I... Uh, been a big part of my career is it has been professional writing and creative writing i was just talking about that yesterday there's um something that's really developed over these years i'm starting to recognize that uh it's it's less laborious for me now okay you know? yeah and um you know it takes practice yeah discipline definitely you know yeah. bruce Springsteen. that wasn't the first song he wrote right right and um brilliant song Definitely. The whole album. Yeah. As yeah. I just said, you know, all I can do is remember following behind your footsteps in the sand, trying to walk like a man. Wow. Great stuff. Makes me cry. It is. Oh, another one. I, look, I appreciate so many of them. Yeah. But uh, people have asked me before, what are your favorite albums of all time? Right? Yeah. Well, that's a really hard question to answer. Really hard. But um, I kid you not, once a year, I get drunk with Joni Mitchell and I listen to the album Blue, usually around Christmas time. Okay. But I sit down alone in the dark with a candle and a bottle of wine, sometimes two, and I listen to that fucking album and I sing every word, even though I can't. Because she's so high, you know. Right, just, right. But I don't care. I'll walk around screaming at the top of my lungs and be hoarse the next day. Because I just think that that was one of the most brilliant pieces of work, most inspiring pieces of work I've ever Blue. experienced. Okay. Blue by Joni Mitchell. If you haven't heard it, you're going to now. I have. Uh -huh. well, it's been a while, but I have heard it. <laughs> Nia Sounds has signed some artists and won some awards in the International Film Festival in Milan. Can you tell us more about Nia Sounds, about the documentary? Oh, well, yeah, that's, that goes back a little bit to the other sure. story about yeah, my we, albums and my healing and all of that. So Nia Sound started as a compilation record label, and that's all it ever was intended to be. Okay. But being a lifetime, an artist and a creative uh, um, and a musician, I always had a fantasy of turning into what I call a real record label, where, yeah. you know, you develop artists. That's mm -hmm. what real record labels do, or that's what they used to do, right? And, but it was really a lofty goal. Yeah. You know, I don't have that kind of money. 
you know, because that, you know what it takes. Right? It's a lot. And it's a different world we live in. You know? They say, I was sitting at a table one time with a bunch of cats who are all executive, big people in the record label, yeah. in the record industry. Um, I've been really fortunate in that regard. In one situation, it was kind of an impressive situation. It was like eight of us at the table, and they were all big shots. And somebody asked somebody else who was the head of a label, and they said, so what does it cost to, what does it cost to break a rock band? And without hesitation, he said a million dollars. If you don't have a million dollars... Don't even try. So, right, well, that was after I had already signed some, you know, that was, but that's, that's it. I've always thought that it was more than I could afford, but it was always a dream. So when I released my album, I was putting it on my label. Yeah. You know? And then uh, when Rob Dacre, my producer, released an album, we distributed that as well. Yeah. So I was really fortunate to be able to be involved with somebody who really is a major world-class talent who delivered an album with three or four instant classic incredible songs. Um, an album that any red major label would sign um, if he had the opportunity to get some. It's just like these days, they don't do that shit anymore. Right. You know what I mean? And Rob's a producer, so it worked out really well for us. Yeah. And uh, so we signed Rob, you know, and distributed uh, Binary Affairs, which is... A great, really, really proud of it. It was a great experience. And then our next artist was Terry Robb. And uh, I met Terry because I love this story. Yeah. <laughs> I met Terry. I know I've, I've seen Terry for years. And, sure. You know, I, and Terry and I know people in common, but I'd never met him and I uh, always respected him. But we, I was working on a song with Rob, and Rob says, turns to me, he looks at me, he goes, We need a guitar player. <laughs> I laughed. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're one of the greatest in, 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 that I know. Yeah. And I'm not too shabby. I mean, right. What are you talking yeah. about? Two guitar players here. And he says, no, no, no. We, we need the guitar player for this song. We need somebody who can play like slide blues. I mean, it's, it's in their DNA. And I went, how about Terry Robb? And he says, you can get Terry Robb? I said, I have no idea, but I won't know until I call him. <laughs> and so um, I got his number from a friend. And uh, called Terry, and he came in, and uh, Terry Robb did the tracks, his his part of that song, in 15 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes. Ooh. Finally, I don't know if it was the fastest session he ever did, but he's just so brilliant, yeah. right? And so we developed a relationship, sure. and um, I, I had always wanted to do a, uh, a compilation for Nia that was a blues rootsy kind of thing, mm -hmm. and so... I hired Terry to record three songs, solo, not writing them. And so uh, we met over at uh, Dennis Carter's at Falcon Studios, and uh, I just said, go. Just, <laughs> just do this thing. I'll tell you when to stop, you know? And uh, I think he was done in a half an hour. Wow. Right? He, he recorded three separate pieces you know, nine minutes, ten minutes worth of music that I was willing to put on a record. Kind of almost first take. Wow. You know, he's just so good. But he had, uh, in the first session, he had said, I said, so what's going on with your career? And I'm going, oh, he's, well, I'm getting ready to sign with a record label in Germany. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. So a year later, I said, well, how's it going with the record label deal with your eyes in Germany? And he said, well, it didn't pan out. And I said, well, why don't you sign with me? And he looked at me and said, I didn't know it was an option. And I said, well, I don't know that it is, but, you know, I don't know what your needs are. Right. But, uh, you know, I, I distribute music and I publish music and... You know, it would be a real honor, the opportunity to sign one of the greatest in his work. Terry Robb's considered one of the greatest living acoustic blues guitar players in our generation of our time on the planet. Yeah. And not just by me. No, he is brilliant. He is absolutely brilliant. So, um, you know, we, we talked and we negotiated and we got to know each other a little better and Terry came on. So, so we have me and Rob and Terry. We're on our second album with Terry. And we have a hip-hop artist. His name's Ella. Can he you spell that? Ella, I-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Okay, that's what I thought. And um, his, uh, his brand name is S-O-X-O Supreme. Okay. And this guy, he knocks out two songs a week. I mean, he's prolific, like wow. crazy. And he's blown up. He's getting a lot of traction. He's doing really well. Nice. And uh, so that's it. So, what type of hip hop is he? Is he is he a vocalist, singer? Uh, is he a rapper? Is it a combination of both? It's a combination of both. Yeah, he falls he falls a little bit more into the R and B hip hop loungy kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
down tempo. Okay. Nice. Yeah. More love song than, you know, okay. gangster stuff. Right. For right. Sure. Yeah. It's yeah, good. He's really talented. Nice. Yeah, he's That's got awesome. a well, he's got a bunch of and just go on the internet and you see tons of videos. He's been picked up by the dance community's picked up his stuff. So there's all sure. there's a ton of hip hop dancers doing stuff to his music, which is helping blow him up. Yeah. So that's the story with um, Nia Sounds. It's a good story. You got a lot going on with that. Uh, so how did you develop your drive and grit over the years? I don't. I don't know that I developed it. I'm. I remember my life has never been just kind of a low, slow slope. Right. You know, <laughs> it's just never been that way. And for right or wrong, it's just, it just hasn't been that way. And uh, so as I already explained to you, I got involved in the drug culture really young. And in my process of escaping that, there was a lot of soul searching. Yeah. You know? And we all soul search through our whole lives. And certainly through our teens, we're all soul searching. Right? Isn't that what a lot of us do? We lay on our backs in the backyard with our friends and look up at the stars and go, what's it all about? Right. right. So we all do that. And I was doing that after escaping my first bout with heroin addiction. And I felt compelled to make some decisions about what life was about for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, d I decided a few things. And one of them was that it wasn't about making money and that it wasn't about failing or, or, or succeeding and that it was about having following your interest and, and having experiences, rich experiences that could, you know, build a build a life of substance. Yeah, that was always important to me. I wanted a life of substance, and so with that comes some risk, you know. Yeah, you don't want to go for a, a stroll in the country, which is great, or you want to climb a mountain. You know? And when you're climbing the mountain, you don't cry when you get afraid. You just keep climbing the fucking mountain, right? <laughs> so you asked me where I got grit. Yeah, I don't think I do have grit. I just have determination and discipline to keep going on the path that I decided to. Okay. You wouldn't have gotten where you have gotten without that. What are you going to do? Turn around and go back? <laughs> Hell no. Yeah. You, you can yeah. turn, you know, you turn around and go back and boom, you get hit by a bus. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, that's another option. I mean, it can Hopefully happen. Not. Right? Yeah. Right. And yeah. I don't know. I'm not a mountain climber. Right. But, um, because it scares the, the Jesus out of me. <laughs> right. But I do know that it's a lot scarier backing down off a mountain than it is to continue going yeah. straight up because yeah. I had to be in that situation one time Ooh. where I was bouldering with my friends and I got on a, and I was like, I can't do this. I'm going to go back down. And I started like going, well, wait a minute. No, oh, I can't go back down. <laughs> the, the safest way out of this situation is to continue. Yeah. Yeah. That is good. That's a good analogy. I have uh, one guy that I interviewed, UC Suto, from, he's from Romania originally, and uh, he and his wife last year climbed both Mount Kilimanjaro and Fuji wow. last year. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of cool. That's yeah, very cool. I got yeah. a lot of respect for those guys. Yeah. <laughs> as crazy as I think they are. <laughs> uh, Kilimanjaro is like a 10-day trip, and I guess it's more, some people say it's more of a walk than a, than a climb, but still... That's awesome. Who are some people that inspire you or have inspired you over the years? So many. Yeah. So many. But I'm going to tell you about one in particular. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who uh, he had a, a, a very, very successful life in the early part of his life. He grew up with successful parents and everything. By the time he was 25, he had lots of money and he was a successful construction company. Anyhow, he sold everything and um, he bought a bunch of land on the California coast and he was going to do something with it. And it got an injunction and stopped his construction project. He was going to build a spa. And um, in the process of fighting that injunction, it cost him every dime he had and almost cost him the land. Well, I didn't know him through the whole first part of his life or through when he got this land, but I knew him at the, I met him at the end. Well, he was always so positive and just like, it didn't bother him. I mean, I would have been going crazy over this thing, right? Yeah. And um, so I remember asking him, so how do you do that? And he said, well, you never know the end of the story. <laughs> I think that's one of the most inspiring things I've ever heard in my life. That's amazing. You never know the end of the story. 
And so the end of the story is that just at the last nick of time, the injunction, he, he beat it. And he had days to exercise his permit or else he was going to have to start all over again after years and years and years. I don't know what the limitation is on permits, but it's just how it worked out in the story. And he didn't have any money. He had enough money to go rent a backhoe. He didn't even know how to run it. And he took it up to the property to dig a ditch. That was exercising his permit. And then he put a sale sign on the land and sold it in like a couple of weeks. <laughs> and lived happily ever after. Wow. You never know the end of the story. You never know the end of the story. That is a gem, man. That's going to go in my... Uh... Can you tell us about your current projects and where you'd like to focus your creative energy? Or I wish. Do we have to buy the book? I wish. <laughs> I really wish I could. I'm I'm at a crossroads right yeah, now. I, yeah. I really want to um, do something different. Yeah. I feel like I've, I've reached the end of, of my purpose with Nia. Okay. I will always be a part of Nia. Yeah. Um, I'll always have value and it'll always inspire me, but it's not my creative work. And right. I just want to do something else. I'm 65. I've been doing it for 22 years and I'm ready to do something else. And I was really inspired by my music. Yes. And the success that I had at creating something that was worthy, something that was substantial, you know? Yeah. I, I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. And I don't know if I'm, what am I going to do with that? You know, I'm 65 years old. I'm going to have a rock career. I mean, come on, forget about it. You know, it could be a songwriting career. Maybe, I don't know, but I'm inspired to consider it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm thinking about that a lot. Nice. I really don't know what I want to do next. Okay. Be a photographer. Um, I was, I don't know. I have, a, I have choices. You I'm do. Really, I'm really blessed. Definitely. I'm really blessed. I can I can make a change. Well, you have talent as well. And you have, like you said, the discipline and the drive to be able to see it through when you decide to do something. Well, thank you for the nod towards my talent. Um, that's always a subjective thing. And I, <laughs> and I appreciate uh, uh, you uh, saying that. I think it's a scientific I fact now. It's, I, not, it's not just an opinion. Because I respect you a lot. <laughs> And I wish I had the drive and the discipline that I had when I was younger. That's why I tell you, I said it earlier. I said, do it as soon as you possibly can. Yeah. Because when you get older, it wanes. It absolutely does. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of great success stories where people had their greatest success after 60. Yeah. A lot of them. Yeah. Uh, I'm still struggling with self-doubt. I'm still struggling with lots of things. And, you know. Age and, and, and growing old, it's not, for the, it's not for the weak at heart. Right. You know? It's true. Yeah. Well, so. you're doing it well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if there's, if there's a good way to grow old and a bad way to grow old, I think we, we know which one we'd prefer. You know, life is interesting to me. Yeah. And I think as long as you're interested in life, then, you know, life is, you know, worth living. Definitely. Yeah. You've survived hep C. Can you tell us about the process and how you were able to maintain your health and vitality? Luck. Yeah. Really. I And, you know, modern technology, you know, I, they came up with a miracle drug that, that cured me. It was the, my third treatment program, uh, Harvoni, and it worked. It was awesome. And, uh, you know, I really took it seriously. Yeah. You know, drinking the proper amount of water every day and... And eating all organic food and a lot of blueberries, I remember. A lot of blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and exercising a yeah. lot and meditating. Yeah, and meditating a lot. Just take it seriously, you know. Take everything seriously and hope for the best. Yeah, you know, because if you don't commit, well, my metaphor for that is skiing. If you're going down, I don't care whether it's an easy slope or a hard slope. I like to ski, and I know it pretty well. You hesitate, you fall. Yeah, that's it. You, you got to be aggressive. You got to have your weight on your leading edge, and you got to be on top of your skis. As soon as you go, whoa, bam, you're down. Yeah, and I think it's that way with life. Yeah. You know, so when you're faced with a situation, or when I'm faced with a situation, I feel like I'm in a non-option position. Okay. Right. It becomes a non-option for me to proceed forward. And so healing from hep C and getting my health back, it became a project for me. There you go. You're a project guy. Right. Yeah. I love it. It's That's important for people to learn how they learn or how they need to do their work, their best work, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. What are one or two memorable stories from your career so far? The, the things that reward me the most are when I've had an opportunity to support somebody in finding their path, their greatness. Nice. Yeah. And um, in Nia, 
I'm filled with many, many opportunities to do that. Yeah. And and have done so. And some of them may not be recognizable to them, <laughs> you know, but I see it. And uh, those those are my best stories, you know, for my own heart. Yeah. And oh, I got a good one. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell yeah. you one. I got a story. So um, when I moved from Miami to Colorado, as I said, when I was in my late teens, trying to heal from my, my get out of the drug culture, I lived in a small town outside of Colorado Springs. I met a guy, and his name was Eddie Burns, and Eddie Burns was my best friend. And Eddie and I were hardcore kids together. I mean, Eddie's idea of having fun was fist fighting. At 3 o'clock in the morning, we were so drunk we couldn't stand up. Seriously, he broke my nose one night. I, I loved Eddie, and we had such a great time. He was a Colorado cowboy through and through. And, uh, well, as I said, the drug culture followed me around. Yeah. And uh, so Eddie and I, I, I taught Eddie how to play guitar. He was fascinated by the guitar. So I taught him a couple, a couple of chords, right? He knew three chords. And, and that was it. We were on a trip, and we stopped off with these people to spend the night. And they were really nice people in the mountains in New Mexico. And there was a couple of guitars there and a lot of cute girls. And these people had like six kids, and three of them were girls our age, and they were really good looking. And there was, it was kind of a hippie commune kind of thing. And uh, so I said, hey, Eddie, you know, why don't you uh, pick up that guitar, and you and I will jam. And I promise you you're going to impress the ladies. And uh, I don't want to be too crude, but, you know, we were 19, you know. <laughs> That's all we cared about, right? And so we did. He said, I can't do that. And I said, yeah, okay, so listen, we're going to do this. We're going to start with G. You remember that, right? We're going to go G, C, D. And then we're going to go, and then we're gonna go D, C, G. And then we're going to go C, D, G, okay? We're just going to mix them up. We're going to do the same songs, and we're going to play all night long. And all you got to do is just do that thing, and I'll do my thing, and we'll have a great time. And sure enough, and there was a few songs I pulled up out of that. We had a great time. Um, Eddie fell in love, and uh, the next day we're we're driving away, and I said, "Well, wow, Eddie, did you do really good last night? And uh, that was a lot of fun. You should you should you should play guitar. I mean, you should really learn how to do that." And he says, ah, "I'm too old. He's 19, right? <laughs> he says, I'm too old. I can't do that." And I said to him, "I said, Eddie, uh, you're never too old to get a little soul." And I didn't know I said that to him. I never paid attention to it. It was just an offhanded thing. And I looked out the window, took another drag off the joint, and we were on our way. It was really soon after that that I left that part of my life and never saw Eddie again. But it wasn't so soon after that that uh, we lived in a small town. We never kept our houses locked or anything like that. And many times I would come home and see Eddie sitting on my couch playing my guitar. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a guitar of his own, and that was okay, right? So... Eddie left. He was always a big part of my heart. Actually, one time I went back to that place when I was uh, probably 50 years old okay. to try to find Eddie. I had a business meeting in Colorado Springs, and I drove up to the top of the pass and went around and said, hey, anybody ever heard, you know, because he was the kid. He was the guy, you know, right. and uh, um, nobody nobody knew anything of him. And so I just went, oh, I guess I lost Eddie, you know. Well, I got a phone call. Facebook, thanks to Facebook. Yeah. Right? So I get a friend request, and I get it like three or four times in like a week. And finally, I saw Green Mountain Falls, and I went because he didn't say Eddie Burns; he said Ed Mathis. And so, and, and you know, he's an old guy, you know. Right. But I went Green Mountain Falls, and I went Ed, Ed, Eddie, Ed, that, that's Eddie. You know, I looked at it a little closer, but that's Eddie. You know, so I accepted the friend request, and uh, so Eddie and I reconnected. Nice, right? And Eddie, because of that moment, Eddie's entire life was being a professional musician. Wow. So he really took it to heart. He took it. He when went I, with when it. I left, he went with it. Wow. And uh, we had a great week. I flew to Michigan and we spent the weekend together and <laughs> we just played music and drank beers and played. And so that was one example of, of me having a positive impact on the planet, <laughs> I think. And I had another one like that too. Yeah, uh, there was a there was a kid that I met when I was about the same age, a little bit after after I left there. I went to Walla Walla Washington to visit my sister, and I used to go play at this uh, really beautiful place at the university where there was never anybody. And I'd go there and play. One day I see a kid off in the bushes, and I say, "Hey, what are you doing?" He was just listening to me. Right? <laughs> and so I said, "Come over here." And he had a flute, and 
So I said, you play that thing? He says, well, you know, I'm in band. I said, well, get it out. So I taught the kid how to jam. Nice. Right? Yeah. And, you know, so I picked the major key of flute. Oh, was it C? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, C. I started playing in C. And I said, just play anything you want, you know? And he's like, oh, wow, this is cool, you know? <laughs> and um, so I saw that kid uh, like five years later, randomly at a party, completely unrelated. And uh, he just graduated from Berkeley School of Music. Wow. <laughs> He's like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm running into you tonight. I'm just home. I just graduated. And, and you know, you inspired me to my life path. That was your question, that right? That is great. Yeah, uh, it's beautiful. What would be your advice to 16-year-old Stuart if you could go back and tell him and he would listen? Relax. Okay. It's going to be okay. Get out of your way. Trust your heart. Don't take it all so fucking seriously, man. <laughs> It's good. We got we to hear that sometimes and, and tell the person in the mirror that sometimes, right? Right. People's stories have multiple layers. You are certainly no exception. So can you talk about this? Uh, father, husband, musician, business owner, multiple businesses, international company, songwriter, friend, etc. You have a lot of hats you wear in life. How, how do you identify with each of those? Or any any ones that you want to talk about. I mean, this re- really is about a creative journey. It's about your life. But you know, each of us has a story to tell. Where we are. Well, you're just you're asking me about the layers of the all layers of, that. of each. Yeah. I think I only have one layer. Okay. And, and I think that that's that's a part of me, but it was also conscious. It's like you asked about the grit and all yeah. of that. You know, um, I'm. In with all five feet. I, yeah. I, I, I don't turn back. I, life is a non-option position for me. Right. Um, I, I, I lose friends more often because I'm too deep for them. Okay. Than the opposite. Yeah. I'm too intense for people. Yeah, it's really true. Yeah. I, I have somewhat of a lonely life. I have beautiful friendships, uh, but honestly, people don't like to hang out with me out here because I'm intense, you know? And, you know, you ask me a question, you're going to get an answer. It's yeah. going to be honest. You say, what do you think of my new girlfriend? Are you going to, you know, I can tell you how many friends I've lost over that question. And uh, so I think that's the only layer that's I the layer. got. That's okay. it. Me, I show up. I show up. It's good. Or I I want to. Yeah. You know, I strive. How are some other ways that you would you would put that? So you show up. Uh, you're present is one way that comes to mind, but th- I think it's more than that. You're engaged in what it is that you are doing. Sure, and 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 I think that um, I think that uh, you know we, we have an agreement, right? We make an agreement with ourselves. I made an agreement with myself that life would be more than making money. Um, yeah. And I needed to have depth, meaning, and purpose, and which meant show up, which meant you know, what I just said, yeah. you know. Um, somebody asks you a question, be honest, tell them the truth, you know, yeah. and even if they don't want to hear it, that's their business, not yours, you know, because they may really want to hear it. And I made that decision really early on. And so I'm kind of getting sidetracked with my thoughts here, okay. but, but it rephrase the question for me. How do you look at the layers of your story? If, if you can well as I way. said I don't have any layers right. I, I, I just I do that and I think you asked me then um, how I came to decide to, that that was the way it was yeah or it should be you know there was a time where my um, my insecurities were so great that um, you know I, I couldn't go to a party and have a good time right right and you know I remember thinking leaving a, leaving a situation like that right and thinking oh wow that was really a failure you know i didn't make any friends i didn't meet a girl or you know i feel miserable you know i made a fool of myself right and thinking gee i wonder what it would be like if i just completely didn't care cuz i just made a fool of myself so if i if if i if i if i approached it like i didn't care and just went all in i might make a fool of myself but i just made a fool of myself so what difference does it make? Either way, right. I'm going to make a fool of myself. Yeah. Right? And so the next time I had a situation like that, I totally, I mean, this all happened like in a week, right? I remember it distinctly and just clear like it was yesterday. So I took a completely different tack and made an absolute fool of myself, but I had a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It didn't matter anymore, you know? So that was the point where I kind of made the decision. Well, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
Are you going to hold back while you're skiing down the slope? Or are you going to jump into that sucker and take it down? You know? There you go. So how does somebody develop that or make that decision to not care? People go up to an open mic with a guitar and they're like worried because the person that was before them was a really good guitar player and they're stressing out because they're playing in front of them. Yeah, look at know. Bob Dylan. Think of, read Bob <laughs> Dylan's book. <laughs> All right. Read Bob Dylan's yeah, book. Because, go. oh my God, I, just, I got that book for Christmas and I just finished it. Well, he wrote a lot of books. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the name of this one, but it talks about when he first went to New York City and was playing at a, at a club run by Fred Neal. And, and when I think about it, so much of the front part of his career he wasn't even playing his own songs. He was doing Woody Guthrie songs. Okay. Right? Yeah. But he was too completely committed. He was going to be Woody Guthrie. Nobody could tell the skinny little kid from fucking Minnesota who couldn't sing and barely play the guitar that he couldn't be Woody Guthrie. <laughs> He believed it, man. Yeah. He fucking believed it. There was no turning back on that guy, right? And he developed into Woody Guthrie. And he became who he is, Super right? prolific, yeah. Super yeah. prolific, yeah. right? So I just, as I was reading that, I just kept thinking, you know, here's a guy who didn't give a fuck what anybody thought. <laughs> He just honestly didn't give a fuck. He was committed to his path, and he was committed to his vision, and he didn't care. Right. And he even said it in certain ways. Didn't he say that about when he went electric? Because people were like, they were expecting the acoustic Bob Dylan. Right. He didn't and care. No. He doesn't care. Nobody could, nobody, nobody could tell him that he wasn't going to be Bob Dylan, you know? So how can you teach somebody that? Yeah. I don't know. I, I taught myself that. Yeah. He might have been born with it. I don't know. I'd like to ask him that question. This is a really, really great question. All right. If you hear this, Bob. Yeah, right? <laughs> Call us up. Stuart.fm. <laughs> Shit, I'll drink a six-pack of Guinness <laughs> with you anytime, buddy. How do authors, writers, musicians, and creative artists keep from being obscure or obsolete or maybe even thinking that they are? Thinking that they are would make them obscure or obsolete yeah. more than anything. Yeah. Because... Honestly, the the most honest art is created when you don't care, right? Yeah. If you don't have any attachment to results. Results. Right. Yeah. And I know mine is and result driven creative endeavors are the ones that are more compromised. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because I do that too. I think we all dabble with the, <laughs> with both of those. You know, it's really back down is really back to that thing. Get out of your way, commit yeah. to the line and 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 do it. Ski yeah. it, you yeah. know? And, and and don't think about, you know, the back to the ski metaphor or, you know, the football metaphor. You don't don't think about the party after the game. You're in the game. Right. You know? Yeah, that's awesome. How should artists develop better business and marketing practices? Mm. Understand that it's part of their art. Yeah. Yeah. You have to take responsibility for it. It's all part of the package. And that's not the same thing as the previous question where it's, you know, you feel like you're obscure or you're trying to create art to sell. It's just your art should be authentic to your drive, your vision, your heart. But then marketing is a part of it. You have to understand how that applies. Otherwise, you can't eat more than Top Ramen if you're lucky. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I have a very intimate relationship with this because I do business consulting, you know. Yeah. And so, um, and I've heard so many times, you know, but that's not my skill. And I said, well, then hire somebody to do it. Well, I don't have any money to hire somebody to do it. And I go, well, then it better fucking become your skill really fast. That's the advice. Yeah. That's it, you know. And I'm terrible at math and accounting, but I could go tomorrow and get a job as a CFO with all confidence. I could answer the ad and sit down and say, I can run the financials for this company because I had to teach myself how to do it when I couldn't afford somebody to do it for me. Yeah. And so that's it. You know, if, if you're a musician and you got people to do all that stuff for you, good for you, bro. <laughs> but I would suggest you understand it well enough that they can't rip you off because how many musicians have we know ended up broke? You know, yeah. Mick Fleetwood's a great, ex you know, is one example. Mm -hmm. Willie Nelson's another, right? Um, there are lots of famous stories about people who trusted people with these things that they weren't compelled to do or didn't think were their skill sets. But I say, 
you, you have to understand it well enough to know whether or not the people who you trust are really doing the right thing for you, yeah. at least that much. But most everybody starts out in a position where they have to do it all themselves. Yeah. So, true. so do it, <laughs> learn it. There it is. There's the slope. Ski it. There right. it is. There it is. Thank you. How important do you feel writing, music, and the arts are to society? No, oh, they're everything. Yeah. Okay. We wouldn't have society without them. Yeah. Yeah, we'd have a machine with no direction. Yeah. It's it's a travesty. Uh, the 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 even even that the world is hinting at going in that direction is freaking me out, man. <laughs> it's just freaking me out. If I were king, <laughs> Seriously, it would it would be the, the 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 biggest priority in my kingdom would be the self esteem of the children, so that they could grow up in their greatness, so that they could contribute to society in their highest, you know, in, in their with their greatness. Whether that's being an artist, or whether that's being a businessman, whether that's being a salesman, whether that's being a farmer, it don't matter. We need people doing everything, but we need people who 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 are in the right room. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And people need to to be inspired, you know, and there's lots of ways of becoming inspired, you know. Nature or art or people, relationships. Art's a part of it, you yeah. know. And uh I remember one time in an interview Mick Jagger was asking us, So what's it like being so rich? And he said, I ain't rich. He says, Are you kidding me? He says, There are rich people and I ain't one of them. He says, I can buy a boat and drive any car I want, but man, there are guys who can buy buildings and countries and you know, I, he says, I'm the court jester. <laughs> he said, That's about how relevant I am. When wow. the rich people want some place to go hang out and have a good time, I'm the guy who stands up and goes, Hey, I'm inter- let me entertain you. You know, that's how important my job is. Wow. I thought that was really, really brilliant. However, I think he was really undermining the value of art in the world when he said that. True. Where he put himself in the court jester position. Okay. It's so much more than just entertaining. It's it's inspirational. Yeah. And and then, you know, the Rolling Stones are one kind of art, but then there's so many other different kinds of art, you know, and been moved to tears. Just moved to tears. I, I've I've experienced art that's changed my life. I think it's very, very important. Nice. Thank you. Should writers, musicians, and creative artists just go for it or get a stable job and do their writing or art on the side? Go for it. Go for it. Go for it when you can. Yeah. As you can. I wasn't willing to sacrifice my family right. for, for art, but I waited long enough. Well, yeah, I waited to, I never really committed myself to my art before that. That Honestly, makes sense. You know, yeah. That's the truth. I mean, I, I was pretending like I was, but the truth was I wasn't. Right. You know, because I had the part-time job. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like Terry Roth says, <laughs> how do you become a job. musician? Quit your job and practice. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the two steps. <laughs> the two steps. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. Uh, the best guitar player on my block, you know, uh, I sold him his first guitar because it had three strings on it and... I didn't know I could go to the music store and get it fixed. And, you know. <laughs> okay. So he went to the music store and got it fixed. And his dad showed him a few chords. And suddenly he was playing, you know, Van Halen and Ozzy and all that kind of stuff at the time. That was what was happening. And uh, he would miss school playing guitar all the time. He didn't get his license till he was probably 21. Didn't have a job. He played guitar. Uh, was that was mostly what he did and uh when i went to see his band play for the first time you know man was he good (laughs) he was playing all the best stuff note for note probably cleaner than the people that wrote it you know yeah yeah it's that's it's a lot of time but it's very focused on that too i think sometimes the most technical players aren't the best writers because they're sometimes letting the technique get in the way of the what the song needs you know, I don't know. There's, um, you know, there's all sorts of examples of different kinds of people living their art. Yeah. You know, and it's useless for us to name them. I had an experience the other day. I was uh, shooting a video for Terry Robb at Falcon and worked with my friend, anyhow, Dan Pred and um, 
Dennis Carter, who's one of the most respected uh, music dinosaurs legacies in this <laughs> town, right? He's, he's had the most successful, one of the most successful recording studios for independent artists in this city um, since 1985, I think. And uh, Dennis Carter, he's a legend, yeah. right? He's a legend. And I don't know Dennis really well, but he's just the best guy in the world. Do you feel like you've known him your entire life if you've met him for five minutes? He's just a beautiful man. Anyhow, Dan Pred says to me, he says, I need you to go stand in front of the microphone and pretend like you're a guitar player. And so I, I took my Eddie Van Halen post. I was just joking around or something like that. I said, do I got it right? Because I don't really know because I've never really been much of a guitar player. And I made a joke about my 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 shortcomings as a, as a guitar player huh. because I've never really thought of myself as a guitar player you know? wow. I, I play guitar okay I can write songs I've been in bands I'm, I'm, a, I'm an okay guitar player I mean you know my guitar playing as well You're as anybody you a way better guitar player than Elvis ever was <laughs> <laughs> there you go there you go anyhow Dennis he says that's because you're a songwriter, Stuart. And I went, wow, Dennis Carter thinks I'm a songwriter. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I don't know how that fits in your thing. Maybe no, I just patted great, myself man. on the back on your dime. Though. <laughs> but uh, it really, really felt great. So I don't know if that's true. You yeah. know, I don't know if that's true. I, I, I would never tell somebody, you know, don't become a great guitar player because <laughs> you should focus on being a songwriter. I would never tell them that, you know. Yeah. Um, certainly Eric Clapton does both. You yeah, know? Yeah. And yeah. So I didn't know how to answer that question, okay. except for I didn't become both. <laughs> I don't know that I've become one, actually. Uh, <laughs> I think I think you do great with your guitar. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is there any way that we as artists can work together, help one another, to and maintain our own creativity? Every way. Own? Yeah. Every way. Every way. Every way. I think it's lacking. And I do outreach yeah. in the Portland community or in the music community, um, mo mostly recently, because I didn't realize it earlier. But uh, one of the things about musicians that I find kind of ironic is how they separate themselves from each other. Yeah. Right? Right. There's this judgment thing. You, know, you go to a club, you can tell, always tell who the musicians are because they're the ones standing <laughs> right. in the back going, I could do that. Yeah, yeah. I could do that. <laughs> it's such bullshit. It's I just, know. it's complete it is. bullshit. Because it, it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter. And right. we're all, we're, we're all struggling with the same goal. Yeah. Whether you're playing heavy metal or whether you're playing pop, whether you're playing reggae, I don't know, matter. We're all doing the same thing up against the same challenges. And we all need people to play with and we all need inspiration and we all need to be, to feel like we belong and that we're okay, that we're accepted, you know, because we're all such drama, drama queens <laughs> struggling with our self identity, right? I mean, yeah. seriously, right? Yeah. Like, I'm a unique story. Fuck that. <laughs> and status quo, bro. Um, uh, but, you know, I take myself way more seriously than I should, and we all do. And, yeah. and it would just be so much more fun, and we would, you know, everybody would benefit if there was a um, much more open symbiosis, I believe. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not saying it's terrible. I'm just saying that the more open it is, like I remember I, I've been in some times in the music where it was like that, where it was really exciting. And everybody was just like, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and I have to say LA in the late seventies when uh -huh. I was there, it was really very, very open like that. You know, everybody was just jamming with everybody and playing with everybody. And look what came out of that. Yeah. A lot of great music. A lot sure. of really yeah. great music, you know, and uh, and certainly the you know the '60s, you know, the late '60s right. and the early '70s. That was just all. A lot all of those people on. knew each other, even you know the the '50s and '60s, because you know Elvis and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and all those guys like Johnny Cash toured together. Absolutely, like in the same car. Sometimes it's like absolutely that's crazy, right? Absolutely, and sitting in the hotel rooms and right. playing together and jamming together, and I don't care if your if your veins pop. If you get an opportunity to play with your bros who are reggae, do it, you know? Because yeah. you want to play. And the more diverse you are, the the more you can bring to your table. Mm -hmm. And the more recipes you can, you know, the more recipes you know, the more you can flavor your own food, I guess. Yeah. Right? That's good. So, rapid fire questions. Okay. Best band. Oh, my God. I can't do anything <laughs> rapid fire. Don't ever put me on Jeopardy. <laughs> Especially something like that. Best band. Band, Steely Dan. Best visual artist. Were they a band or are they just two guys? Yeah, okay, Steely Dan. Uh, best visual artist. God, I want to say David Lynch. Okay. Best place on earth to visit. 
Mm, not possible. <laughs> not possible. <laughs> but I know you're challenging me to say something. And you can so. answer with more than one. Too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Can it? Let, can if I? you want to go back through all of them again, too. Uh, any so place in there, Italy. <laughs> any place in Italy. Nice. <laughs> any place in Italy. Best place on earth. Uh, where the people are happiest. Yeah. Okay. Uh, really. And uh, where the food's the best. S- some of my favorite places are um, Amsterdam. Okay. I love just for that today. very reason. Everybody's just so freaking happy there. I mean, it's even been rated that way. Israel. Okay. Yeah, the food is great. The people are great. You know, Whether you agree with their politics and their religion, y- y- I can't tell you. And it's just a really good vibe there. Um, Thailand. Okay. Oh, my God. Now, I, I don't know why that just didn't pop right out. Really, really a lovely place. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, any other best bands? Oh, well, there's the Rolling Stones, of course. (laughs) You can't deny those guys, right? Let me see. I just love them all so much, Danny. Um, I think Fleetwood Mac was a great band. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Best place on earth that you have lived so far? Rome. Okay. Can you say something in Italian for us? No, sì, certo. Ma dai, sono mezzo italiano. (laughs) Cazzo. Gotcha. So can you say, uh, I'm terribly sorry I'm butchering your beautiful language in Italian? Or so that you tried to teach me that once, but I forgot it. Perdonatemi se sto rovinando la vostra bella lingua. That's a great one to learn. I'll have to work on that. <laughs> yeah, learn that, can, learn that in every language. This. You yeah, make exactly. friends really fast. Yeah. <laughs> Would you do anything differently if you could go back in time? Oh, wow. We all want to reach a point in life where we can say no to that. Right. But that's not true. Sure. You know, I have regrets. Yes. Okay. There are and things I would change. Yeah. I think I think we all would if we're being honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stuart, this has been a blast. Are there any questions I should have asked you that I have not? No, you've been fantastic. <laughs> I want to take this. I can write my life story. <laughs> there you go. That was really good. And it was really, really an honor and super flattering. Yeah, I got a little respect for you, Danny. And Well, likewise, I, I've enjoyed your art and your music and your friendship for a lot of years. You know, we had a, we had a gap in there, but uh, I'm glad that we've reconnected. And I really hope that people uh, will enjoy your, your story and that we'll all continue watching and listening and seeing what happens next. Can you tell folks where they can find you online and find sure. out what you're up to? Stuart.fm. 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 Um, SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon. Uh, my website's Stuart.fm. And you can find me on Facebook there and, and Instagram. And uh, if I'm hard to find, let me know because okay. I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Great continued success and happiness. Thank you. Thank you. Find out more at artmedianorthwest.com. A-R-T-M-E-D-I-A-N-W dot com. (laughs) 